Hello. Um, Jay, are you going to, did you open this up to the public? He did, uh, he did, President Appel. Thank you. I want the public to see me putting on my lipstick because I think that's very important. Um, okay, so I'm gonna call this meeting back to order. Um, we convened the meeting, we called the meeting at 5.30 and then we went into closed session. Um, and now we are going to resume our open session. Um, so, excuse me. Um, you know, I think I'm just going to go very quickly over um, our agenda for today. Uh, oh, wait, actually, before I do that, Liz, can you do your little, your announcement? Liz? Hmm. Oh. Liz, it says you're on there. Jay, is she muted by the system? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Jay, are you able to um, unmute Liz? Oh, it doesn't she, say that she's muted. She must All have right, stepped well, away, President Thomas. Yes, she must she have stepped away. She is unmuted. Oh, she is. Um, Ms. Chires, are you ready to make your announcement? Okay, she might not, must not be there, but we'll, um, when she comes back, we will turn this over to her. But in the meantime, I'm just gonna go out over with, um, with our public um, briefly the, the agenda, which I hope you all have gotten a chance to get on Agenda Online. Um, so, Sorry, President Paul, can I interrupt yeah. you for a second? Uh -huh. um, I, and I don't know, if, Jay, if you can, it seems like people are not, the people who are attending are the call-in people, but people trying to log in um, online are not able to. Should we, oh. should we wait or what's going on with that? Sorry, President Pell, I just. No, 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 I didn't look at, I didn't notice I'm, that. Thank I'm, you very much. Excuse me, I'm gonna repost the link on the website, but I think you guys can continue. Sorry guys, I was having some audio issues, but I'm, I'm back. Okay, great. Um, so I am going to, I'm sorry, we, um, I, I think actually, Liz, why don't you go ahead and make your announcement? We are still waiting for the people who are, uh, there's been some, there's some problem with the, the Zoom link. Yeah, I, so, I Yeah. So, um, do you want to go ahead and make your announcement? Um, este siguiente mensaje será repetido en español en unos momentos. I would like to provide a brief overview of tonight's meeting. After a few procedural items, the board will dedicate 30 minutes to public comment. At the end of the meeting, there will be another and final opportunity for additional comments. So if you do not get to speak at the beginning of the meeting, you can stay and speak at the end. To request to participate in public comment, click on the participants button at the bottom of your screen and select the raise your hand button to request to speak. When called upon, you will be unmuted. After the allotted time, you will be remuted. To comment by phone, you will be prompted to raise your hand by pressing star nine to request to speak. When called upon, you will be unmuted. After the allotted time, you once again will be remuted. The board president will call our students first. If there are a lot of people who want to make public comment, not everyone who raises their hand will get to speak during the first call. The board president will determine whether to set tonight's speaking time at two or three minutes for speaker and on an individual basis. She also has the discretion to allow for extra time for those who need translation or have other speech needs. When your time has elapsed, you will hear your time is up. If you are still speaking, you are allowed to finish your sentence, but please do not continue to speak beyond your time. We understand that there are really important issues that many feel very passionate about, and in order to be fair to all and to hear from as many of you as possible, we ask that you please adhere to these guidelines. Thank you very much. Voy a proporcionarles un breve resumen detallando el orden de esta reunión. Después de unos procedimientos preliminares, un periodo de 30 minutos será dedicado a comentarios públicos. Al final de la junta, que usualmente suele ser después de las 10, habrá una segunda y última oportunidad para quienes desean participar en comentario público. Para comentar por videoconferencia, haga clic en el botón participantes en la parte de abajo de la pantalla y seleccione el botón levantar la mano o raise your hand para solicitar 
necesitar hablar, al ser llamado o llamada, le van a permitir hablar por dos o tres minutos dependiendo de la dirección de la presidenta. Después del tiempo asignado, lo volverán a silenciar para comentar por teléfono. Se le pedirá que levante la mano presionando estrella 9. A ser llamado, le permitirán hablar y de acuerdo al tiempo asignado. Después de su tiempo asignado, se le silenciará el micrófono. Usualmente la presidenta llamará a los estudiantes primero. Por favor, tome en cuenta que si hay demasiada gente que quiere uh, hacer comentarios durante la primera oportunidad, no todos uh, tendrán la oportunidad de ser seleccionados. La, la presidenta también tiene la discreción de determinar el tiempo de dos o tres minutos por orador. Ella, tiene la, ella también le otorgará tiempo adicional a quienes requieren traducción o, ten, tienen, o requieren otras adaptaciones especiales. Cuando haya transcurrido su tiempo, escuchará su tiempo, se ha acabado. Si todavía está hablando, cuando se acaba el tiempo, puede terminar su oración, pero por favor, trate de no sobrepasar su tiempo. Entendemos que hay diferentes cuestiones de, de mayor importancia para diferentes personas. Sin embargo, para escuchar, para escuchar a la mayoría del público posible, le pedimos que por favor respete esas reglas. Muchas gracias. I'm sorry, I went out for a little bit. Um, did you finish, Ms. Chayanez? Yes, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. My um, computer went out for a second. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and approve our agenda. Um, are there any requested changes? Hearing none, so do I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda? I'll move it. Okay, I had, well, this, so now I'm going to say Ty made the first and Khadija um, seconded it. Um, um, Ms. Chaydez, can you take the roll vote? Sure. Uh, Director Leva Cutler? Director Leva Cutler, can you hear me? It seems as though she isn't connected right now. Okay. Uh, Director Brown? Yes. Director Sinai? Yes. Director Hemp? Yes. Vice President Alper? Yes. President Appel? Yes. Great. So the, we have an agenda um, and with no changes. So that's, that's great. We know what to expect. Um, Now, the board members and the superintendent um, will each have a few moments to make comments or share their and share announcements. But first, we are going to hear from um, our union members and our committee members. Um, and then just President, to go over, hello, I'm sorry, yes? Um, we need to do the report on closed session. Well, I was just going to go over the agenda a little oh, bit. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. reading the, this, oh. I, I, my fault, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead and, and, and report back from closed session, Vice President Alper. It's my moment to shine, so I didn't exactly. want you to I know. skip I, it. I wasn't trying to put it off. Okay. Um, all right. Um, item 3.1. Well, and we had an exciting thing happen at the end, too. Mm -hmm. I'll explain. So item 3.1.1, <laughs> um, the board heard an update and discussed. Item 3.1.2, the board heard an update and discussed. Um, item 3.2.1, um, there was a motion by President Appel, seconded by Director Brown. Um, to approve the appointment of Sean Mansiger as the Executive Director of Special Education. All board members voted in favor and uh, the motion passed five to zero. Um, and uh, before I get to item 3.2.2, I'll turn it over to, um, is she here? Oh yes, Associate, oh, sorry, Associate Superintendent Tiara to announce the appointment. Hi, thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to announce that Sean Massinger will be joining the BSUD community as the Executive Director of Special Education. Sean comes to BUSD with 16 years of public education experience and his current role as supervisor of special education in San Francisco Unified School District. Sean oversees all aspects of special education programming for a cohort of 16 schools. Again, congratulations and welcome to Sean. Thank you. Thank you. And then item 3.2.2, uh, the board was about to discuss the superintendent's evaluation when the superintendent accidentally cut off the Zoom link for all of us. So we will discuss it at the next board meeting. Thank you very much, Vice President Alper. Um, 
I certainly didn't mean to skip over that. Um, I, oh, now I, it looks like we have, do have some other attendees that have joined us via Zoom, so that's great. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about our new um, special ed um, executive director, and we can all do our part to welcome him and bring him in. Um, the next, so, um, so I'm just gonna, I was gonna go over the, like what's on the agenda very quickly. So we already had a closed session and we had a report back. And then, like I, I was starting to say, we're gonna have union comments and committee comments and then the board members and the superintendent will each have a couple moments to make our own comments. Then we have a consent calendar and there's a few issues on the consent. I mean, there's a few items and consent calendar items are t generally things that, um, where there is no discussion necessary and no opposition into that is um, anticipated. Um, and so we, we kind of vote those things all in at once. And then we have an update on COVID-19. Um, and some of the things that are, and we're just gonna get a general update, but we all have, also have two action items. And then we are gonna have a discussion about um, where we are now with our new budget process, the process of, of, of developing and then eventually we'll have to approve an agenda for next year. So I'm gonna go ahead and do public comment first. Um, sorry, I think I forgot to say that. But if you, um, since I think that the attendees mostly were not on, were not participating when, um, when um, Ms. Chavez gave the, um, gave the explanation of what to do. If you would like to speak now in public comment, I'm gonna ask you to just put up your hand. Um, so you go to the participants and then you go and you, at, when you do, um, you'll, there's a little, um, there's a few buttons at the bottom of the participant list. Um, you are attendees and you're gonna raise your hand. So if anyone wants to speak, please raise your hand. Um, I'm gonna start with Natalie Orenstein from Ber Berkeley side. Hi, can you all hear me? Yep. Great. Hi, everyone. This is Natalie Ornstein. I'm a reporter for Berkeley Side, uh, and I've been covering BUSD for a few years now. Um, this is something like my 80th school board meeting, but it's my first public comment. And I am speaking tonight because this is my last week at Berkeley Side. Um, and I'll be, I'll be joining the reporting staff at the new Oakland news site that Berkeley Side is launching, uh, where I'll be covering housing and homelessness. But before I make that switch, I just wanted to say a huge thank you, thank you, thank you to the Berkeley Schools community for letting me into your classrooms and your homes all these years, for trusting me to tell your stories, for sending tips and asking great questions and giving thoughtful feedback, and some of you for filing better and more public records requests than I could ever dream of doing myself. Um, this is a this community is a really special one and I actually knew that years ago when I first started covering Berkeley schools as a journalist for the Berkeley High Jacket myself. It's been a lot of fun to revive that role and it's obviously a tough and weird time to be leaving it. But my great colleagues at Berkeley side will keep covering BUSD and I'd personally love to stay in touch with you all, whoever you all listening is right now. Um, uh, right now, for, for a couple of days, my uh, email address is the same. It's natalie, N-A-T-A-L-I-E, at berkeleyside.com. So please shoot me a note there, and I will send you my new info uh, when it's available next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Natalie, and um, I think I can speak for everyone in thanking you for all the attention and care you've taken in um, in presenting, in, in like kind of keeping the community informed about what's going on at the school board and coming to all of our meetings, sitting through hours and hours of our talking. So thank you, and I wish you the best of luck in Oakland. So right now, I do not, oh, I, everyone's, I mean, Brent is clapping. Um, I think probably everyone's clapping. So um, next I would like, I, I'm seeing that there's actually, it looks like, oh, no, it's not true. Deja, De, how do you say, Deja Connerly. Hi, um, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. So my name is Deja Connerly. Um, I'm here to just talk a little bit on behalf of the student body at my school. I am the school's ASB vice president. And a lot of um, students are kind of 
concerned um, about just kind of the curriculum and how we're being taught, you know, like things are really different and it's hard on everyone with the distance learning and learning to adapt to certain things that we um, really haven't, I don't know, haven't gotten as much guidance on, which I like completely understand because this is new for everyone to have to adjust to. But um, I'm sorry, Deja, I'm going to just interrupt you for one moment. Can you, would you mind telling us what school you're, you're, you go to? Oh, I go to Berkeley High School. Sorry. You sounded like it, but I didn't want to make that assumption. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So um, recently we conducted a survey and we sent it out to all the seniors, just kind of seeing how um, everyone was feeling about distance learning. And um, a lot of the questions actually ended up relating back to the mental health of students and how they were feeling about um, distance learning. And I know that a lot of people are inconvenienced right now. And one of my friends recently went into the foster care system and he doesn't really have Wi-Fi and doesn't seem as supported as he should by teachers. And um, a couple of my friends are also failing classes, like simple classes like PE or things that should be easier to obtain credits for. And they're just really confused and we're all kind of confused and it's hard to you know maintain motivation when it's like, We've been working for four years and it's like all of these things are being taken away from us like not that we're we have a right to them but like all these things are kind of just being taken away at once and we just have to deal with the school part and a lot of it ends up being busy work because teachers don't know what to assign and people don't like really care enough to do work because they're wondering what they're working towards and a lot of people feel hopeless so I was just wondering if um, somehow if we could get some sort of like support or like one letter written out with like specific guidelines to see what we could follow to um, graduate or just finish the year off strong because a lot of people aren't really feeling motivated right now to continue their schoolwork or um, just get grades that they think reflect how they're doing because it won't be seen by many people anyway. So, yeah. Oh, I think you're muted still. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you for, you know, for speaking and for sharing with us, you know, what you and your, and your fellow students are experiencing and actually come up with some specific suggestions. So I believe the, the superintendent and the other members of staff will hear that and, and you know, and see what they can do. Um, so I do not see anybody else who wants to speak. Is there anyone else? You put your hand up if you want to make public comment. Okay, well, now I'm going to go to our unions and I'm going to start with Berkeley Federation of Teachers um, and I'm going to call on Matt Meyer. Hey, can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, good evening, school board members and Dr. Stevens. I'm Matt Meyer, president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers. Tonight, I'd like to acknowledge the disappointing reality that we must continue to focus on distance learning for the fall of 2020 and dig into how we can work together to make the best of a frustrating situation. There have been many creative and thoughtful ideas about reopening from district staff, teachers, and community members. And there's an overwhelming desire among all of us to return to the connection-filled teaching and learning that we are able to do when we gather in classrooms. We know that this rich environment and personal contact matters so much, but it has become apparent that there are simply too many obstacles, physical, logistical, and financial, to safely reopen school campuses to all students in August. That isn't to say there won't be some degree of reopening, but we know that there are some major hurdles for all students to be in all classes at all times. We've engaged in this process with great hopes and we appreciate the wide net you've cast to gather ideas and input. But now that the reality is, is becoming more clear, we must turn our focus to meeting the challenge of a new way of teaching for the foreseeable future. In our view, we th and we think you share this, um, that it's gonna require many different types of effort. The first is professional development. We're excited about the decision to implement a week of structured PD at all levels during the last week of school in June. While the experience is fresh in everyone's mind, we can share best practices across classes and schools. This allows the opportunity to learn from each other and to figure out how to address the most pressing needs for the most vulnerable students. We also look forward to learning from our colleagues in other districts where online learning has been successful. The Digitech team has done a great job on very short notice to get people started on the skills um, they, need, they needed to accomplish 
um, the abrupt pivot to distance learning this spring, and that they will be an absolutely crucial part to improving on what we've got done so far. Ongoing differentiated PD to bring even more of us closer to not only tech mastery, but also how to use our technological tools to plan cohesive courses that are both asynchronous and synchronous. We hope that this will be a prime topic of August professional development. The next area of focus will be to drill down and figure out the core standards and skills that can be expected to be taught and learned throughout the grades. Sadly, we have to acknowledge that there are subjects that simply can't be taught as deeply or richly as if we were in classrooms. We will need to align our expectations, and along with them, our assessments, grades, and report cards to reflect that reality. As just one small example, kindergarten teachers tell me that they literally hold a child's hand to help them form letters. This is going to be very tough to do through a screen, and just one of dozens of examples across the grades. We can't act as if our usual expectations apply when nothing is usual. Our experts, like our special education staff, ELD, lit coaches, and RTI teachers must also be consulted in the development of a plan so that our support staff can be utilized effectively to, to make sure our students are supported. We'll also need to find a way to provide key supplies and materials that teachers will need to accomplish the task. Chromebooks that crash during video lessons and stacks of cans balancing phone cameras don't support optimal learning. This may mean allowing some teachers to work from their own classrooms, focusing our drastically reduced funds on necessary materials and relying on our extremely generous and reliable community partners, such as our PTA and the Berkeley Public Schools Fund for help. In addition to physical supplies, teachers will need access to online learning resources. The wide variety of free offerings this spring allowed us to sample what's available, but it will be helpful in the fall if we have access to the same key resources and platforms identified by grade levels and subject matter teams. We know that we'll have to balance a desire for alignment while recognizing different grade levels needs and teacher approaches. In real life classrooms, we readily accept that some students will take different field trips than others, that some teachers will teach an uh, optional poetry unit while others don't. Some will put on performances while others focus on the science fair. It's a good thing when teachers find a synergy between the standards, their students' interests and their own and use that to engage and inspire their classes. We hope that that can continue. It is important that as standards are developed, that they are developed by teachers and provided in advance so individual teachers can have time to develop that synergy. We understand that with short timelines and the urgent need to prepare, conversations and brainstorming will occur in various venues, including site meetings. We also know that you understand that we'll need to actually negotiate about many new expectations for our work. A prime example is what the live video teaching hours and expectations will be for varying situations. Negotiating the framework for ongoing distance learning and providing clarity to all will be a key task for the summer, and we are ready to work with you toward that goal. Thank you. You're muted. You're muted, Judy. Sorry, my whole family is being kind of noisy, so I was muting myself to, so you didn't have to hear from them. Anyway, um, I am wondering if we have anybody from any of the other three unions, either from BCCE, from Yuba, or from Local 21. If you are here, just put your hands up and, you'll, and I'll see it. Okay, hearing none, then I'm wondering if there's anyone who's representing any of the um, district committees. Okay. Um, so now we will have some time for the board and um, superintendent's uh, comments. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Vice, Vice President Alper. I'm good, thanks. Okay, and now Director Sinai. Um, thank you, President Appel. Um, I want to thank Natalie uh, Ornstein for all of her stellar work uh, with Berkeley Side. It is uh, the great democracy that has local press. And if it wasn't for Berkeley Side and Berkeley Times and a few other you know, small venues, nobody would know what the Berkeley Public Schools board meetings were doing um, <laughs> or what was going on on our campuses. So thank you, Natalie. We will miss you. We, we, we trust the other Berkeley Side reporters, but you, you have been um, a very fair and objective and very, um, creative reporter and the kind of coverage that you've been doing for the district. So I really appreciate your work. I also want to thank Deja for um, making your comments about Berkeley High and representing the students. 
I want to make sure my board colleagues and um, the cabinet know that we recognize Deja for this um, year's Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, recognition for her leadership. And in fact, Deja, you know, you do have a right to demand your education. Um, it is a right. And so I want to thank you for coming and speaking on behalf of the students. Um, and just lastly, you know, it is, has been um, uh, a time of emergency, a time of crisis in this pandemic. And clearly from all of the words and news we're getting from our local public health officials, this is not over. And it will require us to do some real serious planning. So I appreciate BFT President Myers coming and talking about the perspective from the teachers and really look forward to working in partnership with our labor partners to strategize together so that we can really meet the needs of our students and our families and our teachers and our staff. We have a long, a long road in a very short time um, to kind of grapple with these issues. So I appreciate uh, all the work that our labor partners are doing along with our cabinet and our staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Sinai. I'm gonna to go to Director Brown now. Thank you, President Appel. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to, uh, again, thank everyone for coming out and joining us this evening. Thank you to the public comments, um, Natalie, Deja, and Matt. Um, I would echo Julie's sentiments around their public comments this evening and the need for us as board members to pay close attention to them. Uh, last night, I had the pleasure of attending the uh, Black and African American Affinity Town Hall uh, and PCAT Zoom session. Um, and in my comments last night, I shared that the achievement gap has been an issue in our district for far too long. Historically, Black and African American children have been impacted by the race and class inequities in education. And adding a pandemic to that um, has every potential to widen the gap. In fact, it has uh, already begun to widen the gap. Um, I was really, really proud to share a space with a collective group of advocates who are standing up to say no longer in our district um, and not on our watch and not with our children. Um, just a, a little background, even during a, pa uh, uh, during a pandemic, the war on Black people continues with uh, police murders as seen by the death of George Floyd, mortality rates uh, now even more because of uh, disproportionalities in, in those who, catch, who are catching the, the coronavirus. Um, and the war on black people continues uh, in education with, uh, with school pushouts. And as a district, we must ensure that we're not mirroring the rest of the world by letting children fall through the cracks of the school to prison pipeline. National data and even our specific data shows that distance learning has not been working well for um, a subgroup of our most vulnerable students, even many of those students who meet the category for, for one or more sub subgroups. So I'm excited tonight to hear an update for the superintendent and to be a part of the many, many conversations uh, that help support our most vulnerable students during this time of distance learning and helps our district uh, move towards, move even closer towards equity and not just using equity as a, buzz, as a buzzword, but uh, helps equity to become a reality in our district. So um, those are all of my comments for this evening um, and I look forward to the rest of tonight's meeting. Thank you, President Bell. Thank you, Director Brown. Um, now I'm gonna call on Director Leva Cutler. Thank you. Thank you for those words, Director Brown, because that was exactly what happened last night. A lot of good conversation, a lot of thought exchange, a lot of ideas that, uh, that were promoted there that, and that people supported that I hope that we can start to take action. And I enjoy, and I like the idea that we're gonna have ongoing conversations with our communities. And actually tomorrow, we will have another thought exchange in Spanish. Vamos a tener una reunión con los padres y nuestra comunidad de padres que hablan español uh, mañana, el 28 a las 5, at, at 5, is it? Is it at oh, six, when it starts? It's 6.30. It's 6.30, a las 6 y media vamos a tener para compartir ideas e información sobre el cierre de las escuelas y la, el aprendizaje de distancia larga. 
Entonces, me gustaría que participen todas las familias. I don't think a lot of Spanish-speaking families are online right now, but I'm hoping that we, we've been pushing this out to many of the groups um, similar to PCAD, Latinos Unidos of Berkeley, the Multicultural Center, Bahia, and other groups uh, who, who have been um, forming, even to the Latinos Unidos of Berkeley, our student high school group. So I look forward to that meeting because Yes, we have a lot of students who've been falling through the gaps and our English language learners are right there also with our so other students who are special needs and African American. So I look forward to that conversation. Um, and I agree that st our students have a very forceful voice to, to say things about what's going on and what's not going on. We need to listen and to also figure out what other ways that we can engage our students and monitor who is not in the classroom and figure, especially with our senior students, um, it just leaves a very, um, I, I don't know the word for it in terms of, and perhaps Director Hemp could, to, you know, there's a feeling there of what happened, it's lost, you didn't, you never had not having to go back. Um, my granddaughter is a junior and she's feeling very less connected to, um, to being, being social. Yeah, it's, that's just totally off the map right now. And so there's got to be other ways that we have to figure out. And I think our students have a better way to help us understand what we can do. So thank you. Thank you, Director Leva Cutler. And so now I'm going to call on Student Director Hemp. Thank you, President Appel. And um, Director, 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 Director Leva Cutler, um, I really, really appreciate what you just said. Um, I wasn't planning on talking to you guys tonight about what I'm about to talk about just because we didn't really know that the results of the senior survey were going to be as drastic as they were. Um, so I'm going to take my comments tonight and like use this time to talk just a bit about that because we don't have um, the ability to put it in the agenda because of the, you know, timing and all of that. Um, so we sent out a survey at some point around last week. And um, I, I did know that we were going to have a meeting this week. I didn't think I was going to bring it up quite yet just because I didn't think that it was going to be um, super surprising, I guess. I was thinking there was going to be like a lot of mixed reviews about distance learning and a lot of people being like, it works for me, it doesn't work for me, and so on. Um, and I read over the results results from the survey a few days ago and I just thought that it was super important to kind of communicate with you guys about what the seniors are thinking um just what um director Livla Cutler just said you know I I do that our class should be heard right now and I know that you guys are um amazing empathetic people so I just ask for you guys to listen and um listen with an open mind um so I, so there, there was only a few questions in the survey. I would say it's probably about like seven questions or something like that. And most of these questions were kind of a rate your experience on a scale of one to 10 type of question. I do think that Dr. Stevens may be including some of those, some of that data in, the, um, in his later presentation. If not, then hopefully I'll be able to get, a, get you know, figure out a way to get it to you guys. Um, tonight, I wish to share with you about eight comments that I pulled from this data. So there are about 200 open ended answers to some of the questions. And I went through all of them and tried to pick, you know, like four that were the most representative of um, the many answers. These are kind of just examples of what I saw a lot of, if that makes sense. Um, and so for the first one I'm going to show you guys is there was a question on the survey saying, if you have felt low motivation or have been unable to do schoolwork, please indicate briefly the reasons to the degree that you are comfortable sharing them. And so for this particular question, there was um, a lot of people saying just like, I've been super duper depressed, more depressed than I've ever been in my life. Um, there doesn't seem to be a point to participating because school's over and um, just kind of you know, short answers like that. And then there was also some longer ones. Um, the, one, the one that I picked first was in uncomfortable home situation with horrible Wi-Fi, depression, anxiety, getting worse daily with no outlet. My healthy coping mechanisms are now gone due to quarantine. So this one I picked because I think that it touches on what Deja Connerly was saying earlier. Our, um, our class president or class vice president was saying, 
about mental health. I think that this one is, a, it's a, yeah, it's a bit, um, a bit longer than the normal answer, but I think that it was good. Um, another one that I picked, this one has some bad language in it, so I'm just going to not include that. But it says, because I'm doing all this hard work for nothing, not even to walk the stage after I spent all that money on cap and gown, I feel like it was a ripoff. I wasted four years of my life. Um, sorry, I'm just skipping over some part. She, this, this student thinks that um, the learning that she's going through right now um, is going to be forgotten in a few weeks. And they feel like it's just a slap in the face because they feel like seniors shouldn't even be getting work um, because they should be given the chance right now to spend time with their family because they've gotten so many things taken away from them this year. Um, they said that they come from a low income family and spend so much money on things for high school and senior year and all that money just go to waste. I assume that that's like prom dresses, cap and gowns, stuff like that. Um, and then they just share that they're upset about the amount of it's being given. And then this last one that I picked is saying, I am privileged a lot of things that allow me to work and complete my assignments and connect with my teachers. But it's hard to not have your teachers in the same place as you are to, go, to just go to them for help. It's hard to teach yourself new things. And it's also hard to connect with teachers because they don't reply to emails like the same day. They have many students who also need their help. So it's harder for me to just get through everything by myself. So those were the answers that I picked for um, if you have felt low motivation, so they're all kind of saying like they did feel low motivation and this is why. As for the second question um, that had an open-ended answer option, it says, has distant learning been beneficial to you in any way? Um, if so, how? I think that this one's kind of a bit more positive. There were some, you know, good stuff sprinkled in there. People were saying that's helping them with their independency. People are saying it's helping them prepare for next year, you know, with like outreach to teachers and stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of people who are saying that they're super appreciative to administration and teachers for acting on this and, you know, about like a week or a few days or even um, hours and saying that they appreciate that they aren't going to be at risk for getting sick. And so they're saying that um, that's why distance learning is working for them because they won't get sick. So the, the four comments I picked for this one, um, there was one saying I get to sleep more, but I've learned absolutely nothing in the past two months. I'm not exaggerating. My teachers have given me no new content. I don't know what to do for my classes to pass. And many teachers are very vague about whether work is optional or no. Um, and then someone said, I like choosing my own time to work and dedicating exactly how much time I want to spend on a given task. I can focus more on what I want to do rather than endure hour long periods of everything. So it's a positive outlook. Um, and then someone said, it's been beneficial in the way that I can work at my own pace and my own comfort in my home, but it doesn't replace the fact that I can just be in a classroom with the same teacher every day and I can stop by whenever I want to ask for help. It's also difficult when you don't have friends or peers with you to work together, working on FaceTime through Zoom or through Zoom together is a little difficult and not the same. Everyone's household is different and we have adjusted to different schedules. And then there were um, a few more comments just kind of saying how, like, no, it hasn't been official just because it's been adding a ton of stress and anxiety to the whole situation. And um, there was a loud, uh, yeah. So in this question, particularly, there were a lot of comments about students saying that some teachers are being apathetic to them about, um, you know, how, how work is being distributed and passing and all that. But then there's also been a ton of comments about how teachers have just really pulled through and been absolutely amazing and supportive. And so I just wanted to um, say that, that there has been a lot of positivity in these answers. Um, but these were ones that I thought were bold because a lot of people were saying similar things and um i i didn't expect this and i think that i i appreciate you guys for listening because i think that um with everything going on understandably this is going to be something that doesn't have a lot of attention paid towards it because there's so many more serious things going on like budget and you know like um, people getting killed and just like so many other huge things going on. And so I really appreciate you guys for listening and being empathetic towards the senior class. Um, and I think that the senior class is, you know, understanding too that 
we of course aren't first priority. I just wanted to come to you guys tonight to speak on behalf of this because I would hate for um, so many to, you know, potentially not graduate because of these reasons that haven't yet been, you know, explained and shared, if that makes sense. Um, I know that a lot of students are stressing about graduating. Deja kind of touched on earlier with um, classes that shouldn't be hard to pass, like PE and, um, you know, extracurricular classes and stuff like that. So once again, I really appreciate you guys for listening. Um, and I look forward to the presentation coming up later from Dr. Stevens. Um, and yeah, I think that that is all I have to say for right now. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Director Hemp. Um, I feel like kind of honored that you have shared with us you know, shared with us the results of that survey. And I think I speak for the rest of the board members that it would be really great if we can all get a copy of it, of the results. Um, I'll be sure to do that. I, thank you. And I also wanted to say um, this understanding or your belief that, <clears throat> that kind of this is the least important thing is quite like opposite from the truth. Because I think the experience of our students articulated by the senior class, but not only felt by the senior class, um, is really like our number one priority. So all of the other things that are also important are all trying to, all trying to, you know, we're trying to make those decisions always with the students in mind. And so I really do appreciate your bringing their voice forward because we need to hear it. We want to hear it. Um, so thank you. Um, I also, I mean, I don't want to repeat what my other board members said, but I, I have to say that, um, you know, I feel like we as a district have done, you know, obviously not a perfect job, but, you know, we've been doing a, a pretty good job of, a very good job of getting through these really unprecedented months of crisis. Um, and we have challenging times coming up, um, coming up um, for, like you were saying, um, Director Hemp to do things like figure out what we're going to do, how we're going to serve our students, and how we're going to how we're going to be able to afford to do that, um, and really um, continue our deep commitment to closing the equity, you know, to closing the opportunity gap. Because you know, it's it's kind of tragic because although there's many things that we've tried and continue to try, and you know, we have some successes and some not so great successes, the opportunity gap is still very, you know, it's still very notable. It's still really big and against African American students, against Latinx Spanish speaking kids and, um, and against special ed kids with special needs. And, you know, and we are like, we have kind of a focused attention that we're paying to each group. And now we're in this situation where, you know, all of the inequities are being exacerbated, I think, as Director Brown was saying. So like everything, like all the racism that leads to the, the societal racism that leads to the opportunity gap based on race is just extend, extenu, ex, accentuated right now because of, because of that people need to have, you know, we're providing computers and, and hopefully internet service to most people, but you know, it's, you also need other resources to be able to, to make this distance learning work. And, um, and it's really, really tough. So, um, so we are going to do the best we can. And I really do want to say that I appreciate the um, Superintendent Stevens and um, the Associate, Associate Superintendent Tiara and others have um, really, and I want to say Natasha Beery and many others have really made a lot of created many opportunities for people to get involved in helping us figure out how we're going to meet this un chartered territory. And so I really appreciate, I want to say that I'm appreciative of you, Superintendent Stevens, for doing that and all your staff. And, you know, I think people have already talked about the PCAD meeting yesterday. It was incredibly, like, vibrant and all these people have, you know, when given a voice, have these great things to say. And um, there's also a community advisory board meeting yesterday that also was really amazing. And the Latinx meeting is tomorrow. And um, the S State Superintendent's Budget Advisory Committee, we have a meeting next Tuesday. So 
there are lots of opportunities. And so I just really, really want to ask all of the parents, or I'm sorry, all the caregivers and the students to please figure out where you can, if you know, let us know what you think, because we are really listening. So whether it's coming to one of the meetings or, um, you know, emailing any one of us or calling any one of us, um, we really want to hear from you. So thank you so much for working with us in figuring out how we're going to move forward. Because like none of, you know, it's one of these things like no one has, no one has the experience of doing this. So we have to figure out what the right decisions are. So um, that's, so I just want to, I want to thank the Berkeley community for, for jumping in and helping us out so we can help you out. Um, okay, so Superintendent Stevens, you're, you're going to wrap us up with our comments. Yeah, I will. Thanks very much, President Appel, and I'm, I'm going to try to be brief. Um, uh, lo lots of thanks on my part as well to all of the various folks who board members have mentioned uh, already. Um, Natalie, to you, thanks very much um, for the, the high quality reporting and best of luck as you go on to your new assignment. I'm, I'm going to be following along. Um, as well, I want to thank all of the uh, participants in our many town hall meetings and advisory group meetings. Uh, we've been regularly engaged with um, now hundreds of folks in a variety of settings, uh, very specifically on two questions. One about the shape of distance learning to come uh, and the, uh, uh, the shape of um, uh, a return to our campuses in next year, should it be permitted. Um, what I really value about these town hall experiences, the advisory committees, is having a direct line of access um, to the experiences that um, our families are having, our teachers are having, uh, through the surveys our students are having. Um, this kind of information, this direct line of information, is directly informative of, of my thinking and thinking of the cabinet and the board. And we encourage our community to continue to stay involved and help us do the best job we can to serve all of our young people as we move ahead through this um, through this situation. Um, I have a, a quick little note to all of my fellow cabinet members, and and that is just to please keep your chin up. Um, I know all of you are pulling very long hours right now, and know that I'm personally just very appreciative of every one of you uh, and the many feats that you're accomplishing on a day-to-day -day basis, so thank you. To all of our classified employees, um, uh, last week uh, was Classified Employee Recognition Week. Um, please know how valuable you are as well as employees to Berkeley Unified. Um, you're the folks who are making everything work. Um, without you, it simply would not be possible. Um, so uh, for you as well, please keep your chin up and know that, that um, we care about you. You. Uh, and then as a final note, um, on a very light note, um, I want to wish uh, the board president a very happy birthday tonight. Um, she has torn herself away from the festivities um, to serve her community. Um, so please know that I'm appreciative of that and, and I'm sure that the community wishes you a happy birthday, President Appel. Make sure you unmute yourself, President Yeah, I, I, I was looking for the button. So thank you very much. Dr. Stevens, you know, I did have huge plans to go out partying tonight, you know, in very close practice. I'm just kidding. But, you know, I really appreciate that. And I'm like, like I said, I'm very honored to be a part of this body. Okay, so um, we are now going to move on to the consent calendar. Do I have a motion to adopt the consent calendar? I'll move. Sorry, Director Brown. <laughs> that I clearly got that one in first. Go ahead. I'll second. Okay. A motion by um, Vice President Alper and seconded by Director Brown. Um, Ms. Chides, can you please take the roll call? Yes. Um, Director Leva Cutler. Yes. Director Brown. Yes. Director Sinai. Yes. Director Hemp? Yes. Vice President Alper? Yes. President Appel? Yes. Okay, so now we are moving past the consent calendar and we're moving to our action items, which are an update on COVID-19 and then our approval of the June 8th to 12th, 8th to 12th um, student makeup and staff planning week and approval of the superintendent's recommendations for, 20 to, and for the 2021 planning assumptions. And so why don't you take us through this, Dr. Stevens? 
Yeah, thank you very much, President Appel. Um, so uh, for this evening's presentation, I'm joined uh, by all of my uh, sort of uh, administrative colleagues here, but particularly by Natasha Beery. She's the Director of BSEP and Community Relations, uh, and then Associate Superintendent Vajay Tiara is here on the Q&A side of the presentation to um, support our responses to board questions. So I'm gonna um, uh, share the screen uh, and we'll walk through a, pr a presentation. Here we go. Uh, so we're pleased to be able to offer this update. It's been the case um, throughout the duration of the COVID-19 outbreak that we've been offering regular updates both to the board uh, and to the community. Um, although this week there's uh, not quite as much to report, I'm going to focus a lot of uh, tonight's presentations on process and a little less on substance given that we've had lots of opportunities to pre present to the board uh, fairly recently. Uh, so this evening, our topics for updates include uh, state and county public health updates. I'll um, uh, look to Ms. Beery for those updates. Uh, I'm going to walk through other feedback that we've been getting on a variety of uh, both surveys and through our advisory meetings. Uh, we'll talk about a process related to fall 2020 planning, um, talk about the ongoing and upcoming community and staff engagement, uh, and then finally move to two action items related to COVID-19. Uh, one is the approval of uh, June 8th through 12th student makeup and um, uh, staff planning week. Uh, the other is a recommendation from me for the approval of uh, several planning assumptions of uh, all designed to permit schools to begin engaging teachers um, to plan for the fall of 2020. Uh, specifically, the action items that I'll uh, request the board approve at the end of my presentation are these, uh, item 12.1.1, approval of the June 8th through 12th student makeup and staff planning week. Um, among those uh, sort of features of this week uh, would be uh, that no new assignments would come from teachers to students as an opportunity to provide students a chance to catch up on any missing work, uh, uh, that there would be no office hours expected of our staff during that week, although staff will be expected to maintain communication with students and accept work. Uh, students may continue to turn in work and teachers will accept it. Uh, and then grades are due for teachers on the same date that they were previously scheduled, which is the end of the school year. Um, an important feature of this week uh, is that it will uh, uh, give us some additional hours to bring together our staff uh, to reflect on the last roughly 10 weeks or so of distance learning. Uh, many of us have been in emergency mode now for well over two months and a much needed opportunity to uh, take a deep breath, to connect with colleagues and to share uh, best practices and lessons learned, uh, I think is of vital importance to the district. So that's one of the um, explicit purposes of this shift in the final week of the school year. The second action item uh, to follow, item 12.1.2, uh, will be to accept recommendations for several planning assumptions for the current school year. Uh, among these assumptions is that uh, uh, COVID-19 will be present in Berkeley. Uh, that, of course, is foundational to all of our assumptions for the year. Um, second is that distance learning will form the core of our educational program for all students at all grades. Uh, and then finally, because of a variety of likely interruptions to the use of on-campus, or sorry, campuses, uh, including including social distancing conventions, grouping requirements, possible school closures, supply shortages. Um, we imagine that our on-campus learning will be supplemental to a core program of distance learning for the coming year. I'm gonna talk much more about how we've derived these planning assumptions, uh, but this is the action item for uh, the board. Uh, at this point, I'll now uh, move over to Natasha Beery uh, for a quick update on sort of recent happenings at the state and county public health level. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Stevens. Uh, good evening, board. Good evening, public. Uh, this will be very brief. We had, uh, beginning in the middle of March, been giving you re regular updates on COVID-19 in the community, and we did stop doing that to focus more largely and more specifically on uh, the repercussions in our schools and our planning. But I did feel it was important to drop in this current update, um, which uh, comes to us from Berkeley side and uh, best wishes to Natalie. Uh, and thanks for the permission to use this uh, because um, what we're seeing here is germane to um, what I'll be talking about in the next slide, which is although um, we've seen what appears to be some great success in beginning to um, flatten the curve, uh, in many respects, there are none Nonetheless, um, a, uh, some indicators that we may be experiencing some kind of surge, um, both in Alameda and more locally. Um, and while it remains to be um, 
determined um, how much of the surge has to do with the expanded availability of testing and uh, that testing is in fact much more widely available including in Berkeley for anyone who's symptomatic not just essential workers. Uh, it could also be that the, some of the loosening of restrictions that we've seen in early May and that we're beginning uh, to uh, have also and an, an anticipating at the end of this month um, could be responsible for some of this increase and so it's uh, we are we are urged to remain um, cautious and to maintain some of those best practices about uh, wearing face coverings and uh, maintaining social distance. In the next slide, um, I'm just going to briefly touch upon um, where we are as far as the um, partnerships and information that we're getting from both um, state and uh, regional partners. So uh, as you all know from the state, we have, of course, the pandemic roadmap, uh, which has the six indicators for reopening as well as the four stages. And we're somewhere in early sec uh, stage two with the opening of schools being late stage two. But what we need to uh, remember, uh, particularly as we hear on the state level that there will be some additional openings. You may have heard, for example, that uh, hair, uh, you can go get a haircut in some counties, not ours, um, uh, some more retail uh, openings, that uh, this is all variable and according to the conditions uh, in the county and in the Bay Area, as you all know, and in Southern California, we do have uh, more concerns and so we'll be opening more slowly. Um, so when you hear something at the state level, it may or may not apply to us locally. Uh, when I last spoke to you, we were anticipating hearing something more from our education partners at the state level with uh, Tony Thurman and others offering updates. Um, so far, although we do get updates, we receive very little in the way of guidance. Um, at the regional level, uh, we are fortunate to continue to form a part of a cons consortium with six county Bay Area counties and Berkeley as the city. Uh, just this morning, uh, Superintendent Stevens and I met with our um, city um, public health officer, Dr. Lisa Hernandez, and she, uh, met with her and another partner from the EOC um, and Song, and they are a conduit to um, other uh, health partners. Uh, we also are part of regular phone calls which are held jointly with health officers and county offices of ed and Berkeley Unified um, trying to align our, and learn from each other um, as to best practices uh, so that's um, really been helping us get um, a heads up as to what might be coming and also share our ideas concerns and questions um, on uh, the county level, um, we have, and uh, Superintendent Stevens has shared with you, um, a template, um, but it doesn't come filled in, so um, it, uh, it, we've adapted it and adopted it to some degree, but we have not uh, had a lot of alignment yet with uh, other districts uh, in in uh, Alameda. And just to want to, uh, on the city level, um, share, and this isn't in the PDF that was posted because it just came out an hour ago, um, that we have uh, additional update and that has to do with childcare. Um, uh, that came from the city of Berkeley, but it's paralleled in other counties that um, child care is now available not just to essential workers but to any worker who is permitted to work uh, under the um, continuing revision of shelter in place. So there's now, for example, retail, curbside openings, things like that, and child care and summer camps also becoming more available. And what we're expecting um, to hear going forward is, as you may recall, the current shelter in place order is set to expire at midnight on the 31st of May. So uh, we expect a revised order. Uh, there will probably be some additional loosenings. Um, however, again, those best practices of face coverings and social distancing will remain in place and will be with us for quite some time. And they're built in, for example, to our plans for the fall. Um, but we, uh, we're trying, in speaking with Dr. Hernandez, what they're looking at is with each of these loosenings. So right now, um, what we're seeing is a spike um, in cases that might be related to um, some of the restrictions um, being loosened in early May. We could see uh, an another spike after Memorial Day and everyone um, running outside uh, together. Um, so we're, we will be uh, recalibrating if need be and always um, working in close partnership with our um, county uh, and city uh, health partners and county office. And that concludes my update. Okay, Brent, are you going to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. It's, it's that mute button that does it to us all the time. 
Um, so so uh, to talk a little bit about the process that we've designed um, that will um, lead us, we hope, to a high quality plan for the fall of 2020. Um, there's obviously a broad variety of folks in the district and in our community who have both expertise and valuable perspectives um, that could be, um, uh, that could inform a plan. Um, we've uh, essentially jerry-rigged uh, structure um, under the current conditions that we hope will allow us to broadly engage both the community and our own staff to solicit, solicit these good ideas. Um, this graphic is meant to represent that structure. Um, of the school board, of course, um, has sort of ultimate oversight and authority to approve plans for the fall of 2020. And the superintendent's cabinet, uh, the group of senior level administrators, uh, will ultimately be um, uh, 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 pulling together the ideas that come from our planning process in order to form a set of recommendations for the board's ultimate approval. Um, key to all of these recommendations coming together is um, a work that school principals will be leading back at their school campuses with school leadership teams uh, and with full faculties as that time is available. Um, I've sort of painted blue the two boxes, school principals and school leadership teams, to represent that these two strategies are really um, complementary. Um, as we work with our principals, we want them in turn to work with their teachers uh, and to solicit the expertise of the folks who are doing the work uh, most closely and on a daily basis. Um, so this uh, work is just beginning. Just last week, um, we uh, delivered to school principals uh, a roughly sketched in planning template that asks them to contemplate a whole range of questions uh, related to um, uh, distance learning for the fall, uh, as well as the use of our campuses in the fall if it's permitted. Um, in addition, we've also assembled two advisory committees, um, one advisory committee that consists of community members and parents and guardians, uh, another advisory committee that consists of educators across all the levels of our school district, uh, including substitute teachers. Uh, these two advisory committees serve as a sounding board as uh, plans sort of enter from idea to draft stage uh, and from draft into uh, final proposal eventually. Um, I'll be sharing with you some emerging feedback from the committees in just a few minutes. Uh, and then finally, labor, our labor partners are uh, critical to all of our work um, to successfully uh, move into the fall. Um, all of these uh, conversations at the school board level, at the cabinets with school principals and leadership teams, our advisory committees and our labor partners are happening simultaneously. And this is one of the challenges we face as a district in that we have a um, huge volume of planning work to do on a very short time frame. Uh, so the cabinet is working overtime uh, to engage uh, on all of these levels to both solicit ideas and ultimately to integrate those ideas into a proposal, both for the board and for our labor partners. Uh, to talk now a little bit about uh, these advisory meetings that we've begun. Uh, just this week, we completed our second round of these advisory meetings. Each of these meetings becomes uh, increasingly more refined and sharp in the questions that we're posing. Um, we've been soliciting feedback from our advisory committee members uh, each week that we're coming together. This is a representation of um, the number of committee members that we right now have participating, uh, just shy of 100. About three quarters of these committee members are participating in the educator meeting, uh, while about one quarter or roughly 30 uh, is, uh, or sorry, about 25 are uh, uh, participating in the uh, community committee. Um, this is a, a representation right now of the level of the school district uh, that is represented in these committees. Um, you can see each of these colors represent a, a portion of our school district. And we've been asking a series of questions of, uh, of these committees. I'd like to walk you through some of the feedback. Uh, in all of these slides, five represents the highest rating. Uh, two weeks ago, we asked the committee members just to comment on the, uh, the design of our uh, fall planning process. Uh, and whether or not they felt we were doing adequately to provide multiple entry points for a variety of perspectives. Uh, these are the results. Um, they are mostly positive. Um, and we're pleased, at least in the initial design, uh, that, that most folks, at least these 100 folks, are saying that we are getting mostly fours and fives in terms of the design of the overall process. 
uh, from two weeks ago, um, a, a number of themes emerged from our uh, uh, committees and I've summarized them here. Um, this is pre relates particular to using our campus facilities. Um, uh, uh, themes included uh, the space that would be needed for physical distancing, um, how exactly we would design small stable bubble groups, uh, the desire to see that face coverings and cleaning supplies are provided, uh, a desire to see more out outdoor space uh, uh, included in the schedule, using space around the district for classrooms, the importance of childcare uh, for young children. This includes both uh, 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 young children of families and young children of our staff. Um, concerns about transportation uh, and then sibling schedule issues uh, and then uh, uh, another theme that some families may prefer to opt out for the fall. Uh, some themes about teaching included uh, that teachers need increased access to uh, classrooms for distance learning, uh, including Wi-Fi and supplies. A uh, real concern emerging about the social emotional health of students and staff, and this is very much to the point of the student testimony that Director Hemp read early in our meeting. Uh, we're seeing emerging concerns from parents and teachers about the impact of uh, screen time on young people, scheduling issues, uh, desire to think more about the teaching strategies that accompany distance learning, concerns about the overall uh, standards, how many are realistically taught within a course of a year, uh, and then a desire to see greater teachers, uh, teacher and student connections. Here's some of the feedback from several of the meetings, and now this is actually from uh, just yesterday, so very recent feedback. Uh, with respect to the question of uh, uh, scheduling at a sort of greater level than we're doing right now, uh, you can see uh, overwhelmingly members of this participant group thought that this is an area for improvement uh, to begin to more consistently schedule distant learning opportunities for students. Uh, committee members are by and large saying that more live instruction is also important to the coming plans. Uh, this is um, uh, over 80% of the respondents uh, agreeing pretty strongly with this statement. Uh, real sort of division in the thinking emerging right now about whether or not we should return to an A to F uh, grading system to increase student buy-in motivation and clarity. Um, you can see that there is a majority that agree, but there's a significant minority among our participants who have some concerns about a return to letter grades. Uh, how to use on-campus time. Um, uh, one of the questions involved when uh, asked the participants to respond to this statement, when students are permitted to be on campus, the primary focus should be on class time and instruction. Um, although we did see a majority, slightly over a majority, um, say that they agreed with the statement. Again, there's a significant minority of these respondents who say that that might not be the primary focus. When we asked so a similar question, should the primary be focus be on social activity and community building, um, more clearly, a uh, majority of the respondents agreed with that statement. Uh, this to me suggests that as we plan for the limited use of our campuses in the fall, should they be permitted to open, um, that it's not just teaching uh, that is the priority, but rather that a variety of activities, including uh, community building and students' connection with each other, ought to be included as part of the plan for the reuse of campuses. This is uh, some of the coming dates that we are looking forward to with our two advisory meetings. Uh, they include meetings throughout the month of June to reflect on the um, ever sharpening plan uh, that will be coming from schools over the course of the next three weeks or so. Uh, to talk a little bit about uh, student survey data, um, uh, about four weeks ago, we were able to survey a very large number of our secondary students. Um, 2,260 students responded. That's about 40% of our total enrollment in grades 6 through 10. Uh, we did reasonably well in collecting a sample that is representative of the larger BUSD population. You can see those numbers represented in the table on the right. Now, what this uh, sample doesn't do, of course, is capture the thinking of students who may not be actively using technology or are inclined to respond to a Google survey. Uh, and so I would sort of warn against uh, too much use of this survey data, given that it may not capture the populations of students who are most concerned about, who may not be participating fully at this moment. Uh, this histogram represents a variety of responses to the questions we asked. Uh, this survey was specific to distance learning. Over on the left, I just pulled out some of the themes where there was either uh, uh, lots of uh, sort of very uh, tall green bars or very tall orange and red bars, just sort of capturing where we seem to see, uh, see a majority of students feeling the same way. 
Uh, some of these themes I can summarize in this way, that most students say that overall their teachers are doing a good job. Most students say that for the most part, their classroom or classmates are respectful during online instruction. About three fourths of students say that they're being assigned work that feels challenging to them. Half of students responded that online discussions with other students are important to them. Um, and very few students are saying that they've been assigned too few students. Again, this um, survey was pulled uh, roughly in mid-April, uh, about two weeks into our distance learning. Of course, many weeks have passed since then. I'm sorry, it's, it's too few assignments, not... Sorry, you said Did I misread, President Appel? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for the correction. Uh, very few students say that they have been assigned too few assignments. Thanks very much. Uh, this is uh, uh, sort of a, just a bar graph representation of the senior survey that Director Hemp uh, uh, referenced earlier. She was reading aloud some of the comments. Um, this is one of the summary bar graphs. Um, uh, this question, I think, tells a lot and is very reflective of the statements that Director Hemp read. Uh, the question is how motivated have you felt to participate in distance learning? Uh, and you can see now the one being sort of low ratings, uh, that a large percentage of our students, this is again seniors, uh, were feeling like they were not strongly motivated to participate in distance learning as this year is coming to a close. Uh, this week, we're doing more surveying. Um, this particular survey will go out to families and staff, and we're changing the focus of the survey away from distance learning for this particular tool uh, to focus on on-campus learning. Uh, very specifically, we'll be uh, querying staff and families about preferences related to on-campus versus distance learning. Uh, this is a key bit of data for us to begin sharpening our planning for the fall. Um, we're asking people for their comfort levels um, with uh, various fall return scenarios. And then we're also querying both staff and families about child care needs for younger children. Last night, um, we held a, a very special event, um, one that many members of the board were able to participate in. This was an African-American affinity town hall uh, in partnership with PCAD, the Parents of Children of African Descent. Uh, we had a number of highlights um, from the uh, uh, thought exchange activity that we conducted. Uh, you can see up at the upper right corner the number of participants, the number of thoughts they offered, and the number of ratings they gave to those thoughts. And among the highlights, the most uh, highly rated of the comments uh, include a desire to see more enrichment programs offered to families of color, such as science camps. Um, uh, still an ongoing desire to see connectivity issues resolved for parents. A uh, higher level of coordination with parents and care caregivers and teachers when students are on or off target, uh, and a desire to see frequent and more person uh, personal texts and calls from educators. Uh, there is, uh, as we've known, a long-standing desire to see a workforce that is more reflective of the Black community, a uh, desire for additional intervention for math and reading. Uh, and then as well, uh, uh, um, uh, one family's um, responding that it was very helpful to have received personal messages from a resource teacher, a special education teacher, uh, when uh, this child's daughter uh, was having frustrations related to distance learning. Uh, we're going to summarize uh, all of this feedback over the next several days. Uh, we're interested to look more sharply at the, um, the overall feedback that came in from this, this important event. Last week, uh, as an update, we met with all of our school leaders, uh, including uh, pre-K, elementary, middle, high school, and adult ed, and our assistant principals, uh, to share with them a roughly sketched in planning template uh, that we're asking them to use back in their school communities uh, to begin to flesh out and identify ideas uh, related to two important topics, uh, how we'll improve distance learning in 2021, uh, and how we might use our campuses, given that that campus use is likely to be highly limited. Uh, these planning templates are right now in principal's hands. Uh, we anticipate a period of several weeks uh, where uh, uh, principals will be engaging their teacher leadership teams, teacher leaders, and full faculties to solicit ideas about a variety of these. Um, although this is a school-based planning process, um, we are not intending to have individual uh, school distance learning plans. Uh, we plan to collect back all of this school-based feedback and we'll integrate it into five plans, uh, one for each level of our district, pre-K, elementary, middle, high school, and adult ed. And we'll look as well to make sure that there are common elements across those five plans while permitting some important differences because of the difference in structure related to these five levels of the district. 
part of uh, giving over the planning template to principals was to uh, provide some planning assumptions. Uh, these planning assumptions are really meant to fill in the gap that we're all suffering from in not having clear guidance related to uh, either distance learning or reopening our campuses. At some point, we're expecting more clear guidance but, uh, potentially from the California Department of Education uh, and certainly from the Alameda Public Health Department. In the meantime, though, without planning assumptions, we were finding that many schools uh, were simply paralyzed by the sheer volume of options that they were being asked to consider. So these planning assumptions represent a starting point for planning. Uh, they permit folks, I think, to imagine into a particular scenario, one that we think is probable, uh, but that can be adjusted as we learn more around uh, through the summer. These planning assumptions make up one of the action items for tonight, uh, and they're written in this way. Uh, first, that we assume that COVID-19 will be present in Berkeley. Uh, because of that, distance learning will form the core of our educational program for all students at all grades. And for this reason, reflecting on and improving distance learning is a first priority. Next year as well, on-campus learning, if it's permitted, is very likely to be limited excuse me, because of social distancing requirements, uh, grouping requirements, periods of school closure, supply shortages, concerns about safety and illness, of course, as it takes place in the community. For this reason, planning for the thoughtful use of our campuses as a supplement to distance learning is a second priority. And I should really underscore, we imagine that uh, uh, our on-campus use will be supplemental, uh, but won't be the core of the learning experience. Uh, we're deriving this guidance from a variety of sources right now, uh, including, I think, two key sources. Uh, one is a broad level CDC guidance uh, that is meant to suggest to localities how to plan for school reopening. Uh, the other is Alameda County Public Health Department's guidance about summer programming. Uh, this is, again, the same authority that will ultimately issue guidance about school opening here in Alameda County. And while it's not relevant to public schools, uh, it does say a lot about how the county health officer is contemplating gatherings of young people in an educational setting. Uh, very likely, as we go into the next year, um, we think that these are the uh, probable sort of requirements that we'll be asked to comply with as we reopen schools. Uh, they include, uh, as we've talked about previously, creating small group sizes, likely uh, on the order of 12 students. Uh, the idea that those groups of 12 students should remain stable. Um, uh, right now, Alameda County has issued guidance that that should be for four weeks. And in fact, we learned today that they've revised it to be three weeks. Uh, each of these groups um, should then be thought of as a bubble and uh, no bubbles should have contact with other bubbles. This is essentially trying to create a, a quarantined group within a school setting. Uh, they also are concerned about the duration of contact between bubble groups. Uh, but are less concerned with contact within a stable group of students. Uh, and then we're hearing a preference among uh, county health officers for outdoor activity where it's possible versus indoor activity. Again, I want to reiterate, these are only planning assumptions. Um, uh, what we imagine is that they will permit schools to plan towards a particular scenario and begin to resolve uh, 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 questions at a, a finer level of detail. Uh, but again, we don't know that this is the fall plan. It's a planning assumption. I want to remind you again, this is the structure. Um, uh, uh, so we will be, uh, again, looking to schools to take the next step over the coming weeks uh, to uh, flesh in these planning assumptions with their best thinking. Uh, I'm imagining that there will be synthesis of these plans uh, to be considered by the cabinet, uh, and then cabinet will begin to um, uh, bring draft plans to the Board of Education. Uh, I haven't calendared out uh, an exact presentation of these ideas to the board over the course of June. Um, this, I think, is one of, the, one of the most daunting aspects of the planning process is that we are dealing with a very large volume of decisions across multiple engagement structures and without a solid set of assumptions underneath us. Uh, and so we'll look to refine a calendar and give the board and members of the public a better sense of when we think we'll be able to have drafts for presentation and when ultimately we think we'll be looking for the board to take action on the plan. I should uh, include an important caveat that simultaneous to all of this uh, will be important bargaining uh, taking place between the district and our labor partners. Uh, these processes will run parallel, will inform each other, uh, but essentially will be happening simultaneous to one another. 
Uh, finally, as I sort of wrap up this uh, presentation, uh, we're looking forward to additional engagement events. Um, we're very appreciative of the more than 135 folks who joined us last night for the affinity-based town hall held in collaboration with PCAD. Tomorrow night uh, will be a, a meeting taking place exclusively in Spanish. Um, I am hosting weekly staff webinars on Thursdays at noon uh, to bring our staff up to speed on developments as they take place on a week by week basis. Um, we're continuing our use of thought exchange as an online survey tool. And again, we'll be uh, sending a survey out to staff and families very shortly uh, related to on campus learning. And then ongoing thanks to our family liaisons in OFI uh, for their equity centered sort of hand to hand um, outreach to families. So uh, uh, we'll move to the action items one last time. Again, there are two action items, uh, the approval of the student makeup and staff planning week, and a second action item related to the approval of the superintendent's recommendations for planning assumptions for the coming school year. Uh, so thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to present and uh, we are available to uh, answer questions. Thank you very much, Superintendent Stevens. Um, I appreciate your the thoroughness of your presentation. Um, I have uh, Director Leva Cutler and then Director Sinai. Yes, thank you. That's, that's a tremendous amount of work ahead of us, tremendous amount of work that's been done up to this day. So thank you very much, Superintendent and the cabinet staff and principals and teachers who, and our community is coming together on this. And in going back to the structure, I, I did mention to the superintendent in terms of the board responsibility, several policies are going to have to be also developed. CSBA is coming out in early June with some recommended templates for a policy that are around sanitizing attendance, enrollment, uh, teacher, teacher and learning, equity, special ed under this COVID place that we find ourselves in. So the work from the board is gonna be more than, <laughs> more than sufficient and I'm sure you know, we have to make decisions before we make policies, but generally it will be, it'll be something that we have to wrap our heads around and um, figure out how we too will perhaps tackle this during the summertime um, from when they start coming out. So uh, I'd just like to remind us on that. Um, also, one more thing. I have other questions, but I know other board members have too. If you can go back to how you mentioned how we, the, the information that you're getting from the town hall meetings and the feedback that we're getting, how are these being used to help, to help um, make these plans with our teachers? And not just with our teachers, but also with our district staff, our custodians, and everybody needs to, to hear what are the thoughts and, and the most popular thoughts that families are giving to us. And so that they, that our community also knows that they've been heard and that we are reacting and, and, and implementing some of those recommendations. Because it's one thing to have it and put out an idea. Another thing is, is it being utilized and, um, and valued and put into place. Yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, we are getting a, a large amount of um, feedback. What I'm pleased about is that the feedback is coming to us in a pretty ordered way right now through a variety of structures that we've designed to pretty broadly engage the community. Um, we are right now, I can say confidently, uh, engaging well over a thousand people um, in these important questions. Uh, my thinking about using the feedback is um, to turn the data from both these meetings and surveys uh, into reports that are made available to principals um, that are reviewed in principal meetings so that they're aware of the feelings coming from these variety of settings. Uh, and then also to make the comments available to principals and the central office staff. Um, the comments as I've been reading them are absolutely invaluable. There are um, often uh, uh, just sort of brilliant ideas embedded in the way people are thinking about these challenges. So that's uh, generally the idea. It's the surveys have the value of both providing um, a sense of where there's agreement or disagreement. And you could see that in those bar graphs that I presented. Uh, and they have the value of just lots of innovative thinking included in the comments we're collecting. Thank you. Did that, did that answer your question? I can't hear you. Sorry. Oh, oops. There you go. I'll circle back later on. <laughs> okay. Um, Director Sinai. Hey, uh, thank you for the report. It's very informative. Um, I think um, I like uh, consideration in relation um, 
you know, all of a sudden the, the tiles shift and you, you move. So sorry, I'm trying to figure out where people are. <laughs> um, uh, in the assumptions, uh, particularly in our school campus sites, I think we need to have assumptions that um, things may change. So our flexibility and our potential need to close down a site if there's a, um, you know, not necessarily one case, I guess we need to have protocols for if there's one case versus if we, through contact tracing, realize that there's more than mm -hmm. um, one student or family that's at risk, what do we do with the building? Um, and I think having that understanding that just because a school site opens, for the limited capacity that we're talking about um, doesn't mean that we don't have protocols for needing to close it on an emergency basis. So I think I would think that that would be an assumption that we need to include in our protocols. Um, I noticed that preschool was almost non-existent in the survey or the, the, part, the pie chart. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that one of the biggest challenges in distant learning is our youngest, our youngest children. So I'm curious to what you're thinking about in engaging the early childhood ed families. Um, and I do have a couple other questions. Well, let me just throw out one other issue and let you to ask, answer the pre-K. But President Appel, I'm wondering if with the short runway, for figuring out the problem solving and the things we need to do, whether or not we also need to reevaluate the board calendar. Because, you know, we usually stop our meetings in July and it might be that, you know, we need to add more meetings, uh, especially given what Director Leva Cutler just said around policies. So I just wanted to, to flag that as well. Can I answer that, Superintendent Stevens? Um, so um, Dr. Stevens and I talked today, well, he actually, suggested and i think it's a great idea that in june that we like basically that we meet every week in june and then i think we can decide you know midway through that or something if we're going to need to meet in july too because i think that we are probably going to still have work to do and we also at the same time want to respect the fact that our administrative staff like that's the month that they have off and if they can't have it off they can't but I think we as a board should also really, I think I mentioned this last week, like our goal is to, to, to be to try to let them have as much of a break as possible because next year is just gonna be really, you know, could be very um, intense. Brent, do you wanna answer that or any of the other, quest the yeah, other I, questions? I, I agree. Um, you know, I, do, I do think that it makes great sense that we just um, uh, sort of move to a weekly pace through the entirety of June. Um, there's just a large volume of decisions um, that will come before the board, both about the budget, which we'll present on next, uh, and about the fall planning. Um, so I think that that's the right approach, and then we'll see where we are as we move through June and assess whether or not we need to keep at our work um, through through July. In terms of pre-K involvement, um, you know, uh, uh, these structures are sort of nested. Um, you know, the work that I'm doing along with staff to form these committees uh, is only one of the ways that we're contemplating uh, collecting feedback. Uh, we have these community events taking place um, almost at a pace of two per week right now, um, the advisory committees, and then really critically, our principals are at the core of our planning process. Um, that includes Maria Carriedo and Josh Reed, who are the two principals for pre-K, uh, and their assignment has been exactly the same, to in, uh, turn around into their own communities uh, and engage as well. So I've been trying to avoid uh, sort of a feedback collection scenario that's either or, uh, but to think about it as both and. There's the work we're doing centrally that is coupled with the work that school sites are doing, and that all of that is of value and will be combined to form these plans. Um, the pre-K plan, in fact, um, is uh, sort of mirrors the plans that the other levels got, and we'll be writing a pre-K learning plan, both for campus and distance learning, alongside of all of the other levels of the district. Thank you, Brent. Um, now I have, I'm sorry, who just asked that? Oh, now I think I have Director Hemp next. 
Yeah, um, sorry, I don't want to take too much time. I just had a quick question. Um, Dr. Stevens, for the survey that you presented at the, um, I think it was like the beginning of your presentation. By the way, thank you so much for that. I can tell it took a lot of um, time and effort because every single slide was something different than the first one. So it was like, you know, I could definitely tell that it took a lot. So I really appreciate you compiling all that information for us. Um, but as for the the first survey, the one that you sent out to, I think it was everyone in the district or at least everyone in the middle school or high schools. Um, what was the the date or, you know, the week that that survey was sent out? Just because I remember taking it, but um, just for my own peace of mind, I do forget when it actually was, you know, because just time is such a blur. Um, so I was wondering if you had that information on hand. I'd have to, um, Director Hemp, it's a good question. I think we were in week three of distance learning at that point. We started distance learning on April 6th, if I'm remembering correctly. So it would have been third week of April, roughly. Um, mm. and it was the window was open for about a week. Um, so probably by the end of April, um, we had collected all the survey back. So it's a, you know, roughly, what is that, about a month old now. For sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much again. All right. Um, do I have, I have Director Liva Cutler again? There's no other board member before me? Uh, um, nope. Oh. Yeah. Oh, well, why don't you go first with the other? Oh, I'm sorry. Did you, uh, did you already speak, Director Brown? I, you just, I did not. Okay, no. so I'm actually going to have her go, f the Director Brown go first. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Superintendent, for um, your presentation. On uh, slide 25, you talked about um, the school planning template um, that will, uh, that has two key parts. Um, I would just want to touch on the improvements to distance learning. Will there be a focus on um, how our uh, teachers um, will be able to reach out or improve uh, communication with with families, especially our families who are following the furthest behind? Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, there is actually a section in the template that talks about family communication. It's there listed as a prompt. Um, many of the prompts in the template are meant to solicit school's best thinking. Um, so there's not a suggestion about how to do it, but there's a prompt to think about uh, improvements to that communication. And if we aren't gonna provide uh, specifics on how to do it, um, will we at least provide a space to uh, be reflective on how those practices are, are or are not working? Um, and also, if we are, how soon will that um, take place? What's the timeline around that? Yeah, so I'm, uh, uh, what we've asked principals to do is turn around into their school communities um, beginning this week. Um, of course, principals, you know, communicating with anybody right now is a challenge by Zoom. It's, um, they don't have the opportunity to walk hallways any longer. Um, so uh, we're hearing about some of the challenges that they're encountering, but uh, many of our principals are starting that engagement with their staff this week. I'm hearing some requests back just this morning that principals would like to use some of the planning time that we're making available on the week of June 8th through the 12th, mm -hmm. uh, specifically for this reflection. Uh, and that seems like a reasonable request to me, um, although I'd love to move the process along faster. Um, at the same time, the, the faster we rush, the less we'll involve our, our important stakeholders, especially our teachers. Director Brown, do you have another question? Uh, sure, I just wanna make sure, uh, it isn't a question, maybe, maybe merely just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. The number of schools uh, and districts now are using um, communication trackers uh, that show what conversations were like with families um, and also to give some evidence um, that phone calls are being made home or emails are being made home. Um, and in those trackers, it's also pro providing a space for community uh, needs based mm -hmm. conversations um, if, if they have the potential to happen. Um, and so I, just in thinking about best practices for our district around communication, that would be something we should look to as well. I appreciate that. Um, over in the sort of special ed realm, um, that's exactly the kind of data our special ed teachers are collecting and entering into our special ed database. Um, um, and I, you know, I will look into that, Director Brown, about the idea of a sort of a different platform that would help us track communication. Thank you. I look forward to you bringing it back to the board. 
Thank you, Director Brown. And um, now I'm going to go back to Director Levikoff. Thank you for understanding. Thank you. Thank you for coming back to me. Um, no, just in terms of when the superintendent mentioned in this plan, in terms of parents opting out in front of the school year, is that to say that parents perhaps do their own homeschooling or um, go to independent studies or just leave the district? And if whatever choices, you know, whatever happens with that, if, if it happens for families, would we be able to track that to see what happens also? As, from one school year to the next? Yeah, I, I do think there will be a variety of scenarios that are all new to us. Um, we'll have some families who decide they don't want to send their kids to campus. Um, mm -hmm. We may have some families uh, withdraw or ask for something like a homeschooling agreement where they're not doing our program, uh, but continue to stay enrolled. Um, we may have families begin to ask for independent study, which is a well-defined program in Berkeley. Um, so all of this is uh, somewhat uncharted territory for us. Uh, and then we'll need to think on a case-by-case -case basis how we pay attention to these families. Um, what we hope, of course, is that families won't withdraw entirely from BUSD. And we want to keep them in the family. I just think it's important to um, collect that information in terms of also the, and disaggregating that information in terms of who, you know, what are the families that are leaving the district mm -hmm. or opting in which pathway for their student. So yeah, that's, awesome. uh, that's a great idea. And I could imagine um, sort of keeping that, keeping track of that data in the same way that we track other enrollment data in our in mm -hmm. enrollment campus. Yes. I think in, in where we're at, it's, in, it, I think it's important information to, for us to also understand, you know, you know, we could do a, an interview with the families in terms of what happened, why, why did they leave or, you know, what wasn't, um, what, what, what our school district was not meeting their students' needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Leva Cutler. And I think I have Director Sinai and then Director Brown. Thank you. Um, looping back to um, a couple of questions, uh, when we're, again, kind of going back to our, our populations that we want to really make sure are not falling through um, the cracks, is I want to just elevate the role and the need to um, address our families who are homeless. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, um, you know, I kind of became engaged with again in just the last week or so, because uh, due to the generosity of donors and the Berkeley Public Schools Fund, we have 10 families that are residing in a hotel. Um, the distance learning, not really, you know, a great opportunity for folks and for people who um, could not get a hotel and are living in a car or couch surfing. So really looking at how we're, you know, addressing and, and uh, you know, I was reading, you know, an article today and there was, you know, some criticisms about, you know, us hyper focusing on our most vulnerable populations that have been reflected in our data as not getting the supports or the academic, you know, um, outcomes that we all hope for, whether it's our African American community, our Latinx, our homeless community, is um, we need to have, you know, a differentiated approach so that we can really find ways to reach students so that they don't lose the opportunity to be educated during this time. And I'm hoping, um, I've been reaching out to the city you know, to try to see what kind of supports we can get for the families um, so that they can get some level of stability in their life while they also try to deal with the challenges of education. So just again, for the sake of the board and the community to know that this is a population that we really need to, to, to have a, a, lens, a lens on and supportive of. Um, Kind of going into some of the platform ideas is, um, I don't know if this is something that exists in BUSD. Um, in the healthcare world, there's bi-directional texting. Um, there's platforms where you can text people with a very brief message saying like, hey, you haven't been in class for a while, contact me. And you can just text right back. Mm -hmm. um, and we do it with our patients. And so basically our patients who have chronic diseases that we need to get, you know, to be monitoring. Um, and so I'm wondering if for our OFI and like our homeless coordinator and the folks who are really doing the outreach to families, 
if there might not be a texting platform that is really convenient for people to respond to. I don't know if we, I don't know if we just try to get on the phone and call people, uh, but we find that this texting platform mm -hmm. is really effective. We get a really good response rate. So, I mean, it's, I think it's health oriented, but there might be some similar products in the world uh, for education. Um, and then the last thing is, could you talk a little bit about how we're transitioning any of our administrative staff and what our strategy is going to be around opening our administrative buildings? Uh, transferring administrative staff, Dr. Sinead, um, uh, help. Well, like social distancing, like, you know, it's business, you know, business won't be as usual also for our administrative folks. Mm -hmm. And is that something that, you know, you're going to be coming to us with any kind of needs for in, input or, you know, kind of where, where are you, what are you thinking about with that? Yeah, well, so we have uh, on a very limited basis um, uh, have our buildings open. So 2020 Bonar is on any given day occupied by a handful of folks. Um, that's mostly been folks on the second floor and business services who are coming in and then observing social distancing conventions. Um, it's also been true of some staff on the floor, like in the enrollment office. Um, so it's, um, we are open on a limited basis. Um, as we go along, we're also bringing back employee group by employee group, some of them at the central office and others who work around the district. Uh, and then for our administrators, um, not, I may not be following the sort of the thrust of your question about uh, sort of transfers. Um, many of our administrators are, are working right now sort of um, in a Wow, in a very flexible way, um, just sort of picking up a whole variety of tasks that might not under normal circumstances be their work, uh, but in any case of um, sort of falling to them. I don't know if I'm I guess, I guess what I meant is if we're gonna like have a policy, which we don't officially have, of where we're gonna allow, you know, administrative folks to continue to work remotely, I or, see. you know, kind of like what are some of the personnel issues that and you don't have to go through them now just in the sense of the overall planning where does that fit yeah i think this is one of those um sort of m multiple policy issues that we'll be contemplating we've begun to have some preliminary conversations about a remote work policy which we don't currently have um, there is some good boilerplate out there by csba and we imagine that as we get closer to understanding our own fall plan um, that we'll then have to think about the policy implications and would likely start with the CSBA boilerplate as a, as a beginning point. Did you have, was your question answered, Director Sinai? Okay, so let's move on to Director Leva Cutler and then Director Barbara, oh, you already spoke, right? Yeah, gotta put your hand down. No, I uh, <laughs> Director Brown? Did you already, did you have something else you wanted to say? I already spoke. Okay. Oh, your hands are down. All right. Well, it looks like, looks like we're, we have nothing left to say, which is amazing. So um, why don't, um, yeah, why don't we make a motion? Let's have two separate motions. Um, one is, for, and you know, really these, both of these have already been announced. I want to mention that both of these have already been announced. Can you to the share school. the screen again to put up the motions? Yes, I'm happy to do that. I was going to say that all of these, both of these items, both the assumptions and the, um, you know, that we're going to have this week, basically this, this week of no instruction, June 8th to 12th, I, I believe that most school communities have already gotten this notice. So I just want to make sure that the other board members are aware of that as, because I think, you know, it'll impact our, our, our vote in our discussion. Um, so, and I, I've heard mostly positive, I think I've only heard positive like responses to this. Yeah. So, um, does anyone have a specific approve. question? Okay, well. I, 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 I'm sorry, I have one more thing, comment. How, okay. is, how is this motion that's gonna impact families and students being communicated to our wide community uh, besides being on A plus news where people might not read in our, or go to our website? I think that's an important piece. I do think that, I'll, I mean, I will say that I think I've gotten three school-wide, you know, news e-newsletters that all have mentioned this, but I think it's a good question because not everybody reads their news, their e email. Uh, if I may, President Appel. Yeah, okay. um, 
Please. Yeah, we'll we'll plan to um, uh, put this out broadly through a whole variety of um, uh, sort of mediums, including you know all of our, our sort of printed communications, our email. Um, we'll send this out on all of our school e trees. Um, to try and get as um, sort of broad as coverage as possible. Uh, I think particularly it's relevant to um, students in secondary schools. Um, some of the kids that we were talking about earlier. Um, who maybe uh, have fallen behind because they've, um, for a variety of reasons, this is a great opportunity for them to understand that they've got a, a moment to catch up. But we'll do our very best to get get everything out through um, through electronic platforms to our families. And I'm um, I'm sorry. Can I just add one thing to that? I'm just requesting that maybe maybe Trish can do this. But I feel like you know each of us has our own way of addressing the. The families that we are connected to and so if I don't know if somebody from downtown could like do like a little something that could be a Facebook post or a um, director hemp maybe you could do something on um, what oh no, I'm forgetting whatever your social media preference is you know I think that's a oh Natasha said we're using Facebook and Twitter well aren't you modern what about TikTok? Uh, yeah, what about TikTok? We can make a little, we can make a little video <laughs> right now. Okay, so I think that's great, Superintendent Susan's, and then I also think if we can try to get it out through our through our networks, that would be good. I'll move to approve item twelve point one point one. Oh, hang on, I think we have one more question from. Yeah, I know sorry, you're sorry. you're gonna get to make the motion, Ty. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm just trying to move us. <laughs> Superintendent Stevens, I'm just, I'm hearing the students in the background. I'm hearing um, De uh, De Deja and, and the survey is, um, with some of the feedback was that they weren't able to reach their, their teachers. So during this week, if they're behind or if they have questions, when we say no office hours are expected, if a student is trying to connect with the teacher, is the teacher expected to respond? What yes. I just want to get clarity on that because this is a little it's a little unclear on the communication for the makeup work if the student has a question. Yeah, the, the office hours is a bit a bit of our own term. You know, office hours was a term we adopted when we um, wrote our first uh, plan. And by office hours, we mean it's it's that live you know streamed availability through Google uh, Meet or or Zoom. Um, that's not expected, meaning a teacher doesn't have to show up for the 180 minutes and just be available. Uh, but the quarter is still open. Uh, they are still accepting work. We're expecting that they'll be communicative with students. Uh, and so using could, we, could we, and uh, Vice President Alper, you haven't made your motion yet, so I don't know if I would make an amendment or just ask Dr. Why don't you just make the motion? Is that we add a bullet in there that says um, the teachers will um, I want to be clear that it's not like they're, you know, they're just hanging on the phone waiting to be called, <laughs> but that the teachers will respond to student, student inquiries toward their makeup work or something like that. Well, I also think, um, Director Sinai, I, I, because I, when you started talking, I was like, oh, we should put that in the motion. And I think that's an excellent idea. And I also don't know how we can say something about the district reaching out to students who aren't, you know, this would be a good opportunity for us to reach out to the students who are not, you know, aren't engaging. So I don't know if, the, I, I don't think we can expect that, all of that from the teachers, but maybe some of our classified, yeah. I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Ophi. What? Ophi. Yeah, could... Ophi. Um, so Superintendent Stevens, um, I don't know what you would feel comfortable with, but I totally support Director Sinai's idea that we add a bullet here that has to do with kind of like Accessible. expectations yeah. of the teachers because remember I, our middle schools don't have OFI. Yeah, that's true too. The middle schools don't have it. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I just feel like we should include something in here that's specifically um because you know the students who are really hooked into the communications of the district, they are mostly participating. And some are failing things like um, PE, I guess, and they they can certainly address that during this week. But it's the students who are really falling through the cracks that I'm most worried about. And I think um, if we can figure out a way, I, I know we haven't negotiated this, but if we could figure out a way within their contract, their current contracts, to make like to verbalize 
that the board has that expectation of our of our staff. So, so maybe we could we could add two bullets that um, teachers um, the expectation the following features are there, that teachers will be accessible to students who have questions regarding their their makeup work you know because that's what the focus is um, regardless of what the class is and then the second additional bullet would be that um, OFI and our because we do have parent engagement or parent outreach at the high school you know and where so where the gap is at the middle school and I don't know who does that at the middle school but that you know the expectation is that we also use that time to try to reach out to the students who have been um, disengaged and I think yeah we can I think, I need to figure out how you, to do it. director Sina are you saying that um, teachers should be available to answer students' uh, questions during what would be their um, already scheduled office hour? Or are you saying? I'm, well, so what I heard, and Estella, I'd love your feedback on this. What I heard from the student survey is that they try to email their teacher, they try to you know, reach out, but they don't, and this is not, I'm sure, universal, but, you know, but that they're not getting a response. And the way this is written, makes me think the expectation for this week is that the teachers don't have to respond during this week and i don't want that to be the expectation i want the ex so I, and I, Dr. Stevens, I, I don't know understand. what if it's through yeah. email i don't know yeah. what the mechanism is yeah i do think uh, you know your line about the um, ongoing expectation of accessibility i think is very reasonable um, I do think if we're going to um, amend this um, to uh, add additional responsibilities for teachers, then we will have to, in fairness, go back and uh, discuss that with the union. Um, and would likely, I'd have to withdraw it this evening and, and, and take it back. Well, I, 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 I do think, though, you know, you've already kind of put out to the school community that we're going to do this during this week of the June 8th to June 12th. So I do feel like the board should vote on it tonight. I mean, you and I have already talked about this. Um, and I think that we, sh I think the accessibility, we can at least say like that instead of no office hours are expected, we can say, I don't know, whatever, they, whatever hours, they, yeah, like hours this week should be used to uh, respond to student needs. Right. Just even though it's available to yeah, I mean, and they can they can do yeah. jump, my, my only hesitation there is that we're also trying at the same time to um, uh, ask teachers to uh, to participate yep. to spend the planning week planning um, and, and by sort of creating restrictive language that asks them to maintain their a similar office hours schedule. Um, I think we'll sort of negate the or, or may potentially limit teachers ability to participate in reflection. And so I'm I guess I'm I think, can I with uh, putting uh, Julie, to increase accessibility. Julie, can Khadija just speak for a moment? Go ahead, Khadija. I think. I mean, Dr. Um, Brown. Thank you. Um, uh, I agree that our teachers um, should be made available to our students, and I definitely want to thank Deja, thank Deja for her comments earlier. But I think that um, adding that in to uh, this to this motion will make it difficult um, to go ahead and pass this without having had uh, the appropriate conversations that are necessary to add this in as a bullet point. What I will say is I think our teachers, I think we should, uh, hopefully uh, enough of our teachers are, are watching tonight or even Matt is watching tonight, um, but I think we should assume best intentions from our teachers and that if they know that students are gonna use this week to make up work, they will be, be available to students to respond um, as far as questions for work. I'm doing something very similar next week with my own students. Um, and the expectation is that I, I will be available to my students who have questions about makeup work. Uh, yeah. I think if, I, if I may, yeah, I think that's exactly the sort of right assumption to make that, that teachers will respond to students. Um, my, my, I just, you know, that, that kind of responsiveness, I think is, um, anyways, it's part of the plan. Um, and I think that most teachers, just like you're saying, uh, Director Brown, will be will be responsive in that way. Um, I do think that you know adding a line about it, ongoing accessibility um, works perfectly. Um, uh, Director Leva Cutler, did you have something you wanted to say? 
but we can't hear you. You're on mute. Just a, uh, you're on mute. Okay, there you this go. This is a great conversation, and I and it, and I appreciate that that was that's being thought of, but um, I think also the alternative is to that the students also know with your caveat, however you're presenting this to the staff, is to you know definitely definitely encouraging all our teachers to have that accessibility to their students, which I know that most of them have um, and feel that they have, but there should be another lifeline that the students can have that if nobody's responding to them, that they can go to who in their, just in their, in their school to be able to, they can go to a counselor, they can, who, do, who can they go to if somebody's not answering their, you know, their SOS? Um, I mean, yeah. There should, I, there should be an all, if the teacher's not, then who, who can I go to? And then that could be also just something that you, in your message and communication to families, if they're not getting a response, who can they go to? Sure. Well, maybe maybe we can say something um, in this that it, it is two bullets, like um, Julie was suggesting. But you know, the first one be about accessibility, like you were saying, Director Stevens, and then I mean Superintendent Stevens, and then the the other one being that the district is committing is committed to be available for for students in need or something like that. Because I do kind of want to do something that's holding us accountable to being responsive to the students who need us. And, you know, I totally understand why we've done the 90 minute office hours. And, and I know that we've signed, you know, we've signed that MOU, so we can't kind of go back on it. But I, I do think a lot of teachers are, are being available to their students, but I'm concerned about the teachers who aren't and for the students who are in their classes, because we also hear from those, those um, caregivers and I, I just feel like if we as a board can do something to try to counteract that or try to help like show our district-wide commitment to being available for our students who are, you know, that are kind of on the sidelines, then I would like, if there's a way you can think of that could work, I would love to do that. Dr. Stevens. Yeah, I, um, I, 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 Again, I'll, I'll sort of offer a couple friendly amendments here, and one is okay. um, to include a bullet that would read that continue, uh, teachers will continue to be accessible to students um, throughout the duration of the week, um, that we'll communicate this opportunity to catch up um, broadly, mm -hmm. um, and that we'll use our specialized staff like our OFI liaisons uh, to reach out to students uh, to let them know about the opportunity. Uh, those, and, and that's how I would sort of uh, suggest those three amendments, uh, if that's acceptable to the board. That sounds great to me. Does that, uh, what do you think, Julie? So um, I'm going to go ahead, oh, I don't know, did we have, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion that we uh, adopt this 12.1.1 um, with those three additional bullets. I'll second it. Okay. Um, Liz, I mean, do you want to take a, a vote? Of course. Director Sinai? Yes. Director Brown? Yes. Director Leva Cutler? Yes. Director Hemp? Yes. Vice President Alper? Yes. President Appel? Yes. Great. And so now we have the second, um, the second uh, action item. Does anyone have any? Wait, well, wait, I'm sorry. Before we move on, can we go back just because I've had my hand up for a while and I just have some. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't um, have, I it's didn't okay, have, forgot to have my thing up. Yeah, please, Director, Director Hemp. Okay, cool. I wanted to talk about this before we made the, the motion, but um, I think it's still okay. I just wanted to um, bring up, I think that the way that we handle this can have a loud voice in the way that we speak to how we have seen distant learning as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if we pose it as something where it's like we're saying teachers have to be accessible, and then we, you know, put it as a bullet point as we just voted on. I think that that's great, but I think that what we should really be focusing on is communicating to the students of what's actually happening right now and making sure that they actually know that this is going to be a week where you need to be doing work mm -hmm. and not trying to push for office, not trying to push for, um, you know, last minute things, because I think that what's going to happen is because no one really knows what's going on. I think that um, that's the biggest separation between me and the students and then you know like you guys who are all working on this like backstage and everything is the biggest thing is that we aren't really talking about it like of course there's the board meetings and everything but those are only really like the parents who 
chime into those board meetings and talk to their kid about it. And then someone hears about it from another kid on social media, you know, I think that we need to have more super clear emails that are sent out to students saying, this is when this is happening. This is when you need to be expected to have your stuff done. And this is when you can talk to your teachers. And this is when you shouldn't be talking to your teachers unless you absolutely need to. I um, think that it's, go yeah, ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I think that it's great that we ask our teachers to be accessible. Um, but I think that they're already going to be, you know, I don't think that, um, most teachers are going to just drop off the face of the earth during this week because I think that what we have seen over the past few weeks is that the majority of teachers want to be there for their students. Right. They I just really think care. it's more on us to be communicating to the students of what we can actually offer them instead of like, you know, saying the teachers need to kind of pull this extra weight of being there just in case, if you get what I'm saying. Does that yeah. make sense? What do you think is the best? I mean, do you think most students read their emails? Do you think we should text yeah. them or what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that a text would be great because I know that we have the, um, we, I think that we have the ability to that because we had the whole like in case emergency text line at the beginning of the mm -hmm. school year, at least for the high school students. And so I think that a text would be great. You know, like if we had something that needed to be super just like drilled in, like this is what you need to know, which I think we do have a lot of things, but I'm sure we could narrow it down to the really specific things, then a text would be great. What we can also do is we can, pan it all out in an email. Um, Principal Schwang at Berkeley High wrote an email um, prior to the survey that was supposed to be explaining, you know, um, graduation requirements to the seniors. And then that was why we sent out the survey um, to kind of, you know, check in. I think that if we were to draft kind of like an email that had all that key information that's been kind of wishy-washy over the past few months, because there's still students who think that they can just not do anything and graduate. You know, those students are still out there. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more than we thought there are because only 200 people answer that survey and it's been out for like a week, you know, and we've been advertising it too and stuff. And so um, maybe if we wrote out an entire email and then texted the students and we're like, check your email, like right now, you know, like read it. Like this is what you need to know. Otherwise you should be worried. Then I think that'd be great. But I also think that we need to realize that this needs to happen super quickly because kids are so, so behind and we only have, you know, like two weeks and some people are working like five days a week and are going to have to really schedule out when they need to be doing what they need to be doing and exactly what they need to be doing. So Director Hemp, um, I'm going to suggest um, that Dr. Stevens work with um, both with Natasha Beery and with, um, uh, with um, uh, you know, our um, information officer, Tricia McDermott, to, um, you know, to try to do those two things, get an email done. And I think if we can text, you know, if we can text people to just say, you know, you've been sent a very important email, don't like yeah. check it out. And um, what I would like to ask you if you can, and you can definitely say no if you don't have time, but I think it would be very helpful if you, if Brent's, if Dr. Stevens and Baje, whoever writes that email can, um, can just run it by you. If oh, you I would, I would absolutely appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Um, Deja, the student who spoke earlier tonight, her, um, she, she's the all student body vice president. I think I misspoke earlier and called her the class president. I, I apologize to her, but, um, she, and then the ASB president, Lexi Tesh, we have been in kind of communication with Ms. Schwang about what we mm -hmm. need to be doing right now. Um, and so, we'd be happy to work with anyone who's willing to help us. I think that, um, you know, like any type of communication is just so necessary right now and would be just super appreciated across the board from students. So if anyone's willing to help, it's totally fine. Um, I really appreciate it. And if you guys can't, if there's too much, then I'm sure that we could figure something else out, whether it's with the principal or, um, you know, even just us. Just Well, I, I actually think, Director Hemp, that there are, I would like to have somebody from, um, I'm going to say downtown, even though it's not downtown, no one's there anymore anyway, but like somebody from the central office, you know, kind of make sure that all the information that we feel like needs to be in there is in there. And then um, I think if you could be the kind of the contact with the students, that would be great because yeah. then you can like, you know, quickly get a, get a quick turnaround. Does that sound yeah. like it makes sense to you? Um, yeah, that sounds amazing. I mean, I was one. I was asked. I was going to ask. Um, also, Superintendent 
Stevens and Associate Superintendent Tierra. Uh, yeah, we're happy to write up the message tomorrow and I, I'm taking notes on the amendments that the board is asking for and I'm happy to send it to student uh, director hemp. Uh, we'll try to do that by the end of the day tomorrow. Thank you so much. That's great. I think it's, I think it's going to be really good. I think especially if we can access the whole, you know, like text message thing and be like, check your email right now. Like you actually have to, like, this is the one that you need to read. Um, because we've been getting, you know, like 50 emails a day. Every time that something is posted on Google Classroom, you get a notification for it. And so that just bumps down any important message further and further down. Um, so any way that we can like point attention to something, I think would be super, super helpful. Can we do that texting, Brent? Uh uh, no. Um, so this is itself a very complicated conversation about federal laws related to um, the use of texts. Um, we've tried texting pilot programs over the last couple of years. They've proved to be far more complicated than we imagined. And this is essentially because uh, families must give active consent uh, for the district to use a text uh, to, to um, send texts. Uh, and that has proved to be very difficult for many of the reasons that engagement in lots of activities is, proves to be difficult. Um, so the texting portion of this conversation, sadly, is, is beyond the capacity of the district right now. I know a lot of teachers have um, ways that they can reach their kids through text, through the app Remind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we I do have... If that's a way. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to return to this topic when we sort of get a chance to sort of better prepare some of the issues that we've been having. Um, Remind is here in the district and we're looking to expand its use. Um, right. And I'd want to pull in the right staff because this is um, well out of my area of expertise about sort of the, you know, the sort of technical features of these apps. Okay, well, so, so that we can, can, can move on with our agenda. I think that, you know, uh, you, you will be in communication with one another and then with Director Hemp. And, you know, it sounds like, I think we're all committed to trying to get to our students. So whether it's asking the teachers to reach out to their students or <laughs> figuring out some way that we can do it, we, I think we're all agreeing that it needs to be more than just an email to actually get to a lot of the students who aren't currently engaging. Uh, yeah, I hear that. And what I, you know, we'll, again, we'll use the mechanisms that we have. We'll, we'll get it out by email. We'll ask that it go out on the e-trees. Um, we can also send it out as part of the activity sets and ask that teachers include it directly in their weekly assignments to students. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, to be the most direct way to get information to students. And, and the one that's probably the most universal and far reaching is the, the weekly assignments the teachers are making. Okay. Well, um, so does that satisfy you, Director Hemp? Yeah, no, I think that that's, I think that's great. Um, the main thing I was just trying to say is that I don't think that we should put it all on the teachers, but of course we can ask the teachers for help um, in a, like, any you know, appreciative way um, and use any other external forces that we can think of. So yeah, um, definitely thank you. And I appreciate the time put towards this. Okay, great, I guess. And they can also, well, anyway, um, I was wondering if we can now go to the assumptions 12.1.2, because we, I want to find out if any of the board members have any concern, concerns about these. Well, probably not number one. I mean, you have concerns, but there's nothing you can do about it. So, um, and number, like number two and number three, um, just because I think that this will be our opportunity to speak about it. So I'm actually going to ask that somebody make a motion and then we can discuss while the motion is, has been, is on the table. I'll make a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation for the 2021 planning assumptions. I'll second it. Okay, so we had Director Sinai make the motion and Director, um, no, Vice it's President it's Albert, Cutler. who was that? Who's me, Leva Cutler. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, babe. Director Leva Cutler. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting tired. Um, and so, um, Ms. Chardis, can you take a vote? Yes. Director Brown? Yes. Director Hemp? Yes. Director Layla Cutler? Yes. Mr. Simon? Yes. Vice President Alpert? Yes. President Appel? Yes. Okay, so let's, is there any discussions about this, um, about any of these items? Does anyone have any concerns? Or well, any we just passed it. 
Oh, we did pass it? I thought we just, oh, we just passed it. Well, there you go. I thought that we were just actually going to make the motion, but I'm glad, guessing that nobody had any comments anyway, because there's no hands. So um, we just passed that. Uh, so let's move on to 13.1, which is discussion item about the budget. Um, and our associate, I mean, uh, well, Superintendent Steph Stevens, I'll let you kind of take the lead on this. Thank you very much, President Appel. So we're moving on to a second presentation. Um, this presentation is meant to um, provide some uh, process-oriented information uh, to the Board of Education and the public about the 2020 budget. Uh, I'm joined tonight by Pauline Follinsby, who's the Assistant Superintendent for uh, Business Services in the district. And what we hope to do again is um, provide two specific updates about additional BUSD budgets that have been impacted by the overall reductions in funding to public schools, and then talk about the budget building process. Um, I'll note that we're not talking about substantive uh, reduction ideas tonight. Uh, we're still uh, in the sort of process where staff is both vetting and researching uh, potential ideas to be presented both to advisory committees and eventually to the Board of Education. Uh, but tonight's presentation, I'll note, is a little different in that we're not bringing ideas to the board yet. We're not ready as a staff team. Um, so the topics we'll cover very specifically um, are these. Uh, we'd like to just uh, do a quick review of previous information about the general fund and LCAP. Uh, this is more a reminder to members of the public about the impact of the Governor's May revise on our general fund. Uh, we'd like then to provide some information about two or three additional resources. Um, uh, the one, the Berkeley School Excellence Program that lots of folks are familiar with, uh, uh, CAEP, which is the California Adult Education Program Grant. Uh, and ACES, which is the California state grant that funds our after school program. I'd like to um, sort of make note of how we're trying to hold several equity priorities through our budgeting process and then describe a little bit the budget timeline that is before us. So just as a quick recap of where we've been so far in reviewing the impact of the Governor's May revise on our revenue for the coming school year. Uh, the last time we were together seven days ago, we reviewed this chart uh, this is a calculation of the impact of a negative 10% reduction in state revenue to two of our funding sources, both the base grant uh, and the supplemental grant. These are both components of the local control funding formula. Uh, overall impact to the base grant is estimated to be close to $8 million. And the overall impact uh, to the LCAP budget or our supplemental budget is uh, half a million dollars. Uh, as a reminder, we're expecting some relief in terms of a, a decrease, uh, rather a, a, a freeze in the rate of increase of our contributions to the ret uh, retirement. Uh, that sort of savings is equal to $1.415 million. Uh, the total budget re reduction target though is now $7 million, uh, just when we account for revenue reductions. Uh, the last time we were together, we introduced uh, that we'll be exploring, researching uh, several concepts for balancing the budget. These don't represent decisions yet, uh, but they're some of the strategies that are on the table. Uh, they include closing some unfilled positions, potentially uh, uh, making an effort to transfer more money from BSEP to the general fund through the teacher template. Uh, it's an important caveat that in this work, we'll have to look for savings in BSEP uh, that we can then transfer to the general fund. We'll be looking hard to see whether or not we can save money uh, because of some school closures in the coming year. Um, that might include uh, some transportation reductions. Um, we're actually uh, reviewing our transportation program, uh, especially considering the um, reduction in ridership associated with um, social distancing. Electricity savings, garbage and recycling, and potentially uh, the um, sort of suspension of any non-COVID uh, professional development in the coming school year. As well, we're thinking about making some program adjustments based on the way that distance learning appears to look in the coming school year, uh, eliminating or um, reducing the use of extended hours for some staff. Uh, we're exploring the concept of uh, furlough days. We don't have any concrete proposal to offer at this point, but it's on the table. And we're also thinking about um, some form either of a, a complete or a partial hiring freeze. So now um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Pauline Follinsby to walk us through some new information for the board. Um, this relates to two grants uh, that Berkeley receives that support both our after school program and our adult education program. So Ms. Follinsby. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Stevens. Um, so this graph that we're looking at um, on this slide, we actually presented it um, as part of the May revise. And you can see there was a significant reduction in several of our programs. I'm going to be focusing on the after school um, program as well as on the um, adult education block grant. So if you look at the, the following slide, Um, so this is our after school education um, program. We know from the May revise, we're going to be losing $100 million um, of state funding. So if we look at the um, total amount of state funding for 1920, the 537 million, uh, we calculated the 100 million was a 19% um, reduction. And if we apply that to Berkeley, um, our district's state funding for 1920, we're going to be losing um, $350,000 um, projected in, in funding. Um, you will get more information from CDE um, when the information is available, but we have to start building our budgets and um, con consolidating our revenue assumptions. So on the next slide, um, this is our adult education program. So we think there's going to be a 12% cut to the originally proposed allocation. And uh, we've gotten a lot of response from um, our consortium who we work with. And the impact's about $400,000. Um, that's on the um, adult education um, funding. We're still waiting for an update on WIA and then um, trying to work with our Berkeley adult education um, in terms of filling the um, shortfall, making up for the shortfall in the budget. So. Um, Great, thank you very much, um, Ms. Follinsby. I appreciate that. Uh -huh. uh, and then just to offer an update on the Berkeley School Excellence uh, Program, sort of BSEP. Uh, I mentioned on an earlier slide um, that one potential concept is to um, look for savings in a, a variety of BSEP programs. Uh, and then to apply those savings to something called the teacher template um, that in effect um, uh, provides some relief for the general fund by transferring BSEP funds, uh, essentially sort of pick, uh, using BSEP funds to pick up a greater proportion of teacher salaries. Um, so to do all of that, um, we're uh, proposing that we will uh, not start the budget and program building process from scratch. Uh, we've been working on uh, moving uh, BSEP budgets through the policy and oversight committee and to the board over the course of now five months. Rather than start that whole process over again, uh, my plan is to work with Natasha Beery and others on the uh, BSEP team uh, to begin a review of each of the previously approved BSEP budgets uh, for potential savings that could be rolled up and applied to the teacher template. So very specifically, we'll be looking at the Brea, VAPA, libraries, technology, professional development, student support, counseling, and achievement strategies, and family engagement budgets. And again, thinking how might we save uh, money in those budgets. Part of that analysis will be looking at the um, expenses most recently approved just in this planning cycle. Uh, but we won't limit ourselves just to new expenses. We plan to review these budgets for existing expenses uh, in light of the you know, ongoing distance learning to see where we can find savings. Our plan then is to compile all of these recommendations into a single document that will represent all these budgets. Uh, we'll share that first with the Policy and Oversight Committee on June 2nd, and we would anticipate then bringing this compilation of recommendations for reductions to all of these BSEP budgets uh, back to the board on June 10th. Uh, ultimately, why we would be doing that again is to try and uh, roll up these savings into, um, uh, into the teacher template, thereby creating relief for the general fund. I'd like now to just talk a little bit about how we anticipate spending June to react to uh, all of this very difficult budget news. Um, the first proposal, which came up uh, in earlier discussions just this evening, is to add two special board meetings uh, to our June docket. Um, this would include a meeting on June 17th. Uh, and on July 1st, this would essentially give us four, um, uh, four meetings, one each week, uh, where we'd have uh, more opportunity both for staff presentations on budget ideas, uh, board reactions to those ideas, and if needed, uh, opportunities to make revisions and represent to the board.
Uh, as I shared before, we're currently in the process of conducting research on a range of budget reduction office, uh, options. Uh, and we're looking right now at accounting for that roughly $7 million in lost revenue uh, and what we expect to be approximately $1 million, there should be a, a million there, not one, $1 million in additional COVID-related uh, spending in the 2021 school year. Uh, we'll continue to use all of our committees to uh, review these ideas. That includes SBAC meetings on June 2nd and 16th. Uh, we've made a, a sort of special arrangement to uh, uh, bring budget options to the uh, PCAD, a second PCAD town hall on June 16th. We'll engage a parent advisory committee on June 4th and DLAC on June 2nd. Uh, again, we'll be bringing these ideas in draft format for feedback to these committees uh, before they're presented formally to the board. Um, we'll again, uh, we'll plan to bring a first uh, package of reduction proposals to uh, the board on June 10th. Uh, and then we'd propose that there be a first reading uh, of the two, 2021 budget. Uh, we think right now on June 17th, uh, we're still putting our thinking together about when we'll do the first reading of the complete budget. And then uh, we would plan on a second reading of that budget on June 24th, so that we meet the June 30th deadline established by the Alameda County Office of Education for the approval of the overall budget. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about how we hold equity priorities uh, through this planning process. Uh, prior to the school closures, we were working on uh, developing potential revenue source for a range of investments in equity work. Uh, that included uh, things like the expansion of the African American Success Project, uh, the uh, expansion of the role of the Office of Family Equity Engagement, uh, and then a number of other initiatives uh, that we thought would um, uh, give muscle to our equity efforts. Uh, we're not letting go of these, um, of these varieties of ideas just because we're in a budget crunch, and uh, the board should expect that as we sort of enter into discussions on June 10th that we'll be presenting um, options and possibilities for the ongoing funding of these um, priorities despite the many reductions we'll have to make. So I offer this slide just to, to let the board know that we're really working hard to try and hold um, these equity priorities while we also wrestle with these huge dilemmas associated with a $7 million cut. Uh, this is a graphic representation of the next month as we're conceiving of it. It takes us from the May 14th governor's revision uh, through tonight's meeting on the 27th. Uh, and then we're laying out both in terms of staff preparations, uh, committee engagements, Board of Education engagements, uh, and then a special note about a PCAD engagement on the, during the week of June 15th. Uh, we hope that this graphic um, sort of uh, provides both the board and members of the public a sense of how we'll move through committees and to the board on a whole variety of complicated topics related to budget reductions. And so with that, um, I'm going to pause uh, and welcome uh, questions of the board. Again, I recognize there's not substantive discussions, but this is really about setting the stage for the work that we'll do in June on the budget. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. That was really helpful and informative. And I want to see if anyone on the board, um, let's see, Director Sinai. You are first with your little blue hand up. Um, a little blue hand. Um, uh, could we go back to um, Associates or Assistant Superintendent Belonsby's chart where she talked about the adult school and the um, and I just noticed that there's other programs on there as well. And of course, for me, CTE kind of flagged out there. Um, and I'm just wondering, have we, yeah, that one. So there's all these different cuts. And so I see um, Career Tech Incentive Program and the Career Tech Initiative. Um, are we looking at, are, are there other cuts in this chart that we're going to be grappling with that we haven't, um, addressed yet? Um, okay. It's more we yeah. have a previous slide from a week ago that was like a blur in my mind. Oh, so, <laughs> so yes, we anticipate that there will be additional cuts and um, staff is currently working with um, their counterparts at CDE to determine the exact amount. So even though the slide says um, that we think programs are going to be cut in half, we can see from ACES the reduction was 19%. Was 
So each, um, each program is gonna have a different um, impact. And once we know that impact, we will then build our budget accordingly in terms of um, looking at um, discretionary um, expenditures, hourly budgets, um, supplies, um, to try and see if we can balance the budget with the redu reduction in revenue. So we, we have many of these programs, but not all of them, right? Not all of them, no. So when, so that'll come back in the next iteration. So I guess the question is the deficit has the potential of, the deficit has the potential of increasing more than $7, $7 million. It could well, Once we realize um, the impact of these programs and if, we, if they have enough carryover, or um, what the situation is with each one. So uh, we have each, each person on the fiscal team is um, working on in each area. And we expect um, by early next week, we will have an idea of um, if there's an additional impact in, the budget, um, in our budget reduction target. And then the only question I had on revenue side is, um, I know we're not a huge grant writing school district, but are we spending any time researching whether there's any COVID related grants that we could be applying for either through FEMA or through other uh, federal or state agencies? I'm working on a grant um, through FEMA and um, we brought um, um, one of the, we got a resolution passed by the board that would allow us to accept the funding from FEMA um, so the deadline for that grant is actually um, a certain number of days after the event. So of course the event is still ongoing, but we're compiling additional costs in terms of PPE and um, you know additional ergo equipment, whatever else may be needed to see if we can get that reimbursed um, by the federal government. So, so your office is getting notifications kind of if, as grants are coming down the pike. Is that, I'm just wondering where that falls. Say again, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm just in the sense of kind of who has their eyes on potential funding streams that are coming out. Is that, um, coming, is that coming to you, Paul? Um, as, as to me, as, yeah, that comes to me. Um, I get a lot of notifications from school services and other organizations. I'm also... Um, part of the CBO roundtable. So um, we're all kind of keeping our eyes open for additional funding um, possibilities. That's really great. And I do think, I mean, we've talked about this before, but I do think, um, I think I brought this up at actually one of the community meetings, but you know, I do really think that some pri you know, private sectors might be interested in, I mean, some have donated money to school districts and so, right. I think that you know we might see if, particularly through parents or, or caregivers in the district who work at those large corporations, I think you know if we could try to get some support there, that would be another another option. But I don't know. I mean, we'd have to communicate that to all the to right. the, to the people. But um, I also um, I'm sorry, Julie. Do you mind if I are you done? Okay. So I wanted to say two things. One of it, one is I think this came up at the last meeting, but the other is, but that is that, you know, there are certain funds, many funds that we have reserves in, including BSAP. And um, this seems like, you know, like you you mentioned this last week, Dr. Stevens, and I think I just want to remind us that this, this is kind of, you know, this is the moment that we saved that money for. So I just really, I just really encourage you to look and also. Um, Ms. Follinsby, Associate Superintendent Follinsby, look at, you know, looking at the, looking at the reserves that we have, you know, not the 3% that's required, although I know some districts are looking at using that too, but um, I don't know, in, in my, in the communications I've been having with other school boards, there have been a lot of discussions about how we're using, you know, our reserves, so, or they're using their reserves, so I do think if, you know, I'd love to hear your discussions about that at some point. I mean, it might be too early now, but you know, to really understand what you're thinking about our different reserves. Um, and then the other thing that I don't, I can't remember whether you and I talked about this, Dr. Stevens, but 
I do think, and I think I heard something today about there being some hope here, that um, certainly um, the city, if not the state, I don't know if this would be the county, but certainly the city or the state, to help us with some of the costs that are going to be, that are going to, um, if we decide to do a kind of group A and group B split where we're going to be providing childcare for the other students, like young students in, in the off hours, I do hope that we're going to be in conversations with the city of Berkeley about how to fund that. Because I do think, you know, the Berkeley really needs for us to, you know, to care for our kids, the kids of, of families who need, of, of caregivers who need to work. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's more than an educational incentive. There's a economic incentive and we just shouldn't be responsible for paying for that. So I'm, I don't know if you've heard where that money can come from, but I think the city has, I think, our, I think the city is kind of thinking about that a little bit and you know, then we could, like that might be another place where we could maybe get some corporate foundations or um, the state to chip in. I'm wondering what you think about that, Superintendent Stevens, if you heard anything about that. Uh, yeah, what I'm, I'm hearing right now in my conversations with city officials is that um, they are looking at a $28 million deficit that they'll have to close in the coming school year. Uh, I have had a chance to sort of share um, some of the steps that we're beginning to take to contemplate budget reductions and hearing sort of a similar story of woe on the city side. Um, so we're going to keep them up to speed on sort of how the needs are emerging. That's both um, on the health side, that's on the funding side, the child care side, uh, and hope to be able to develop partnerships. Um, one example is um, sort of an emerging partnership around mental health um, uh, that, that we are just beginning to explore with um, uh, the city mental health department. And then if I could offer just a, a sort of quick, uh, sort of going back a couple of questions, what I did learn from Wynn Skeels about the reduction to um, CTE uh, is that um, this reduction, the state reduction, would be applied to the 21-22 grant cycle. Um, so we're on the first year of a two-year grant with CTE right now, so we uh, can look for steady funding both for this year and next. Uh, and then it's the next grant cycle, the one we haven't applied for, uh, that will likely have um, sort of reduced uh, revenue. And so we'd be looking a year out uh, at reduced CTE funding through this grant source. Thanks. Um, and they haven't indicated that they're going to reduce those, grant, those grants? No, it's still too early to say how CTE will respond to the, the drop in uh, revenue for that grant program. Okay. Um, Director Leva Cutler, I see your hand up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you for, for the presentation. I was, I was just wondering, we have Kaisers coming in to Berkeley. We have Alta Bates. We have Bayer. In terms of reaching out to them regarding, you know, piggybacking on their PPE and, and helping us in terms of maybe reducing the costs to our district or donating, um, have we thought about reaching out to, to those um, providers? Uh, we haven't been doing that. No, we've largely been just using our sort of existing vendor network to try and find some of, um, um, some of what we might call PPE, but things like um, surgical masks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a pretty decentralized environment out there right now where every district is essentially competing in the market for exactly the same goods. Um, we'd welcome uh, somebody stepping in. We so far haven't had the staff capacity to speak very honestly um, to try and develop partnerships like the one you're describing, although it'd be immensely helpful to us. I'm thinking of our Berkeley Chamber of Commerce being our, you know, being the people that maybe we can tap into and talk to about reaching out to, re reaching out to on our behalf. Um, um, that might be some, a, a source at least, they might be represented there in the Chamber of Commerce. Um, just having that thought. Um, in terms of childcare, childcare is also being cut 10%. In, in our funding, we still ha we also have to follow the social distancing, 10 children. So the amount of children that childcare can serve is gonna be greatly limited also. So, you know, childcare programs are really waiting for school districts to make their decisions so that we can plan whether we're gonna have AM, PM programs or we're gonna have just, you know, we're gonna cut out our morning preschool programs so that we can have um, child care for our school age in the morning and child care in the afternoon. 
So everybody's holding their breath for school districts to make decisions. So it's a domino effect. Um, what happens in one school district, what will happen? Sadly, Albany yesterday voted to uh, discontinue the child development program after 76 years serving children and families in Albany. So that affects a lot of students. It will affect us too. And so, um, you know, this is a very difficult conversation because it's our teachers, our parents, our workers, everybody who's, who lives in Berkeley goes to school. Um, child care is definitely impacted also. Thank you, that was helpful. Um, let's see, do I have any other hands up here? I just closed my thing. Um, I think that's it. Um, um, I do want to say that um, I, again, I think that this, like contacting the Chamber of Commerce, as well as, you know, some of the other, um, some of the other corporate folks, um, I think. I will do it. I will to do that. You will do that. Okay, because I was actually thinking one of the things that we should do is also work a little bit with the Berkeley Schools Fund because I think they have been organizing the volunteers. And I know that in the beginning, we had several volunteers who, you know, like either work at corporations and they were saying where they, you know, a ton of people who do distance learning, um, but also, you know, people who are either fundraisers or, you know, work somewhere. And so I, I would just, um, I think that actually, talking to them to Aaron Rhodes might be a good way to to kind of get so um I'm I'm writing that down director Leva Cutler that you're going to take the lead on that oh Julie I mean director Sunday I just um I really want to applaud all the work that the Berkeley Public Schools Fund has been doing they've raised they're basically funding ten thousand dollars a week for the homeless families to be housed in hotels um, and they really have been doing stellar work. So I think coordinating with them because I'm confident they're approaching all of those, you know, business funders. And so I think making sure we don't, um, and as well as the Berkeley High Development Group, you know, those two entities um, are definitely ramping up their fundraising. So if we can make sure we don't, um, that we coordinate with them would be really good. Yeah, because I think that in some ways, that's such a good thing to bring up, um, Dr. Director Sinai, and I think that in some ways, that's really true, and I think that our asks can be bigger, um, and so we might want to talk to them about how we could work out, like just, you know, it depends on the funder, you know, if there's a, if there's somebody who might be willing to do something larger, then we can talk to some of those groups about, you know, folding the asks in together. All right, so um, I do not think that I have anybody else um, who wants to speak here. So um, Brent, is that, are you done with your, your presentation? Okay, well, then thank you very much because that was really a thoughtful conversation and I'm hoping that I know that we'll be continuing that on a lot in the days, in the weeks to come. Um, so I wanted to um, give the, uh, oh, I had one person before, but it looks like they, they put their hand out. I wanted to tell the 23 remaining attendees that um, now is a time for second public comment. So if you would like to provide that, offer some comments, please put your little blue hand up. Okay, seeing none, we'll have no additional public comment. Um, uh, President, uh, no, I do see oh, one. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Martin de Muta Flores, why don't you go ahead and um, speak? Good evening. Um, I just wanted to call in and, and provide, um, I, I've heard that equity comes up um, as part of uh, the thread that we will be continuing. But what I continue not to hear, and I hear this in other spaces of education well, is that when we talk about professional development and online learning, equity is continues to be an afterthought um, and I really think that it needs to be integrated at the beginning because as this continues on we will continue to see the opportunity gap widen and continue persistent challenges even be kicked down further 
when we do have an opportunity to come back to in person and it's just going to be a bigger lift. So I just really encourage that all that as we think about professional development for our teachers and our classified staff and our administrators that equity be put at the front um, in the middle and the end and as we go through what the training needs are for our folks in the um, schools. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. De Flores. I really do think, you know, bringing that up towards the end is a great reminder. And I, I, I know many of us share that, that sentiment. And so it's a good reminder to keep it front and center. Um, is there anybody else who would like to offer their public testimony? Okay. Um, Cheryl Havens, I know you had your hand up before. Do you no longer want to talk? Okay. Um, well, with that, do, does anybody want, does any of the board members, do any of the board members or the superintendent, or for that matter, any of the associate or assistant superintendents or Natasha, any of you want to give some last minute comments on anything? Okay. Hearing none, then I'm going to adjourn this meeting at um, 943. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.